and welcome to GameSec. That's right, I'm finally checking out the NES. Now my first console was a Sega Master System, so I don't have quite the same nostalgia for the NES as a lot of people do, but I do actually have some nostalgia for the system, which I'll explain as I go. I've always been kind of hesitant to do this episode because so many people have talked at great length about the system that, you know, what else is there really to say? But it is super popular for a reason. Anyway, first up, let's check out a little bit about the console itself. Just a little bit. The Nintendo Entertainment System. In late 1985, Nintendo revitalized the stagnant video game market in North America by releasing a redesigned version of their hit Famicom console, which was already two years old at the time. Nintendo was careful not to use popular video game terminology since retailers were very leery because they didn't want to get burned again due to the recent crash. The system took off very quickly once it was released nationwide. The console features a front loading mechanism which can become unreliable over time as well as an onboard chip to prevent unauthorized games. The games were provided on very large cartridges and came in cardboard boxes which of course were standard at the time. The console came with two controllers which featured a directional pad, two action buttons, as well as two smaller buttons. The shape and layout influenced controller design to this day. Internally, the NES is powered by an 8-bit Ricoh 6502 CPU running at a blazing 1.79 MHz with 2 kilobytes of RAM. It displays a resolution of 256 by 240 generating 52 colors with up to 25 of them on screen at once with up to 64 on-screen sprites. There are five sound channels which pump out some of the best 8-bit music you will ever hear. Game cartridges often had their own chips to expand the abilities of the system to include multiplane scrolling and other features. Overall, there were 678 officially licensed games released in North America for the system. The console was on the market and supported in North America for just under 10 years and sold over 61 million units worldwide. Okay, to start off, I want to talk about some games and series that pretty much everyone equates with Nintendo. Everybody's talked about these a quadrillion times, so I'm going to keep these fairly short. Still, I feel they should be in an episode about the NES, so let's do it. Alright, like I said, we're starting with the big boys that everyone knows. Super Mario Brothers was included with the system and it's a truly iconic game. This, of course, was designed by Shigeru Miyamoto. You play as Mario, or Luigi if you happen to be player two. Your goal is to rescue the princess and kill Bowser dead. This is a tiny game, clocking in at only around 40 kilobytes. That's barely over a quarter mega power, or just over a 1 32nd of a megabyte. And it's amazing what they did with this tiny amount of memory. Beyond that though, I was never really that interested in the game. Still, this game is one of the most recognizable in all of gaming, and even people who have never touched a game often know what this is. And that says quite a bit about it. Then, Super Mario Bros. 2 came out about three years later. My friend Tom recorded some gameplay on a videotape for me to watch since I only had a Sega and he had both Nintendo and Sega. I was really intrigued and he did a full playthrough of the game. I eventually got to play it on his system and I loved it, especially all the new techniques you can use to progress throughout the game and the much improved music. You can even choose from four different characters, all of them with their own abilities. This was the first Mario game that I truly enjoyed. And everyone on the planet, and probably even some extraterrestrials, know that this is a localization of Doki Doki Panic, so I won't go into that, even though I just kinda did. But that's because I'm a hypocrite! Finally, in 1990, Super Mario Bros. 3 was released, and boy oh boy people went nuts. And for good reason, this game is incredible, with lots of new powers for Mario to get. I didn't play this one until it was released on the Super Nintendo, and that might be why I still prefer Super Mario World over this one. Still, it has the same kind of structure, and that can't be bad. It introduced the world map to the series, and I really like that. Though I still like Mario World's map better. This is a lot of people's favorite Mario game, and there's quite a bit that this one offers for sure. The 
The Legend of Zelda was another prominent release from the creative brain of Shigeru Miyamoto. This one's more about exploration, finding items, defeating dungeons, and all that. I've got to admit that I never personally played this one until after I played and beat A Link to the Past on the Super Nintendo. But I did see it on videotape made by friends during its time. It's really interesting to see where it all started, and of course it's still a challenging game that makes use of battery backup. Everything here is iconic, especially that riveting overworld music. The sequel, Zelda II The Adventure of Link, changed things up. I really like the music in this one too. The game now has side-scrolling levels placed throughout a large overworld map with random battles. It's an interesting change and one that honestly takes a bit of time to get used to initially, but once you do, it's actually really fun. You get experience points which allow you to raise your levels which seems weird for a Zelda game, but hey, I like it. Some enemies will steal experience, so be careful. I don't like starting over from the beginning when I die, but hey, at least you get to keep your levels. Metroid is an interesting game that was released in 1986. You guide your dude through a very large maze collecting new abilities and powers in order to progress even further. Or is it a dude? My friend Jimmy beat it and he says you're actually playing a girl the entire time, but I don't believe him. I mean, Jimmy's lied before about things and come on, he hasn't finished it. He's lying, you can never believe him. Still, this game requires a really good memory or a stack of paper to draw the maze. Or maybe an issue of Nintendo Power. But don't toss away that paper because you're gonna need it to write down your passwords. Good graphics and excellent music round things out and it's one of a lot of games that I wish I could have played on my master system. Mike Tyson's Punch-Out is also another game that most people love. I agree with them as it's super fun to learn each fighter's tells and whatnot. Combine that with the music and the unique graphics and you really can't go wrong with this one. Of course, if I go a few months without playing it, I kind of forget how. I covered this one not long ago in an episode called Better Than The Arcade, so check it out. And then, of course, is the Castlevania series. I don't want to talk about them much here as I plan on doing a future episode with all of the 8-bit games in the series, which includes the Game Boy games. But the three Castlevania games on the NES were ones that I really wished I could play on the Master System back in the day, especially once the amazing Castlevania 3 came out. These games definitely deserve at least a quick mention in this episode. The NES, of course, is also where Mega Man got started. And boy, did Capcom take this ball and run with it. Honestly, I don't think most people mind it. It all started with the original Mega Man. Then, Mega Man 2. Of course, Mega Man 3 came after that. Then, Mega Man 6. Wait, no, no, I mean Mega Man 4. Yeah. Then, Mega Man 5? Okay, then Mega Man 6. That's a lot of games in a series on a single console. My favorites are Mega Man 1, 2, and 3. And out of those three, my favorite is Mega Man 2. Once again, this was one that Tom videotaped for me to watch and I was just enthralled with the graphics and music. While I'm certainly not a huge Mega Man fan or anything, Part 2 is a game that I pull down and play a lot just because it's really fun. Finally, for this segment, Contra needs a mention. This one or two player run and gun is immensely fun. You're just a dude who can collect a few different awesome weapons in his quest to defeat the aliens and the humans that appear to be helping them. You've got side scrolling stages, 3D like stages, and even vertically scrolling stages. 
every NES owner should have this one. That was followed up by Super C, which was arguably even better. This one had proper top-down stages as well to play through. You can't go wrong with either of these Contra games. You can't go wrong with Contra Force, however. It was originally going to be an unrelated game called Arkhound, but hey, why not sell a few more copies by calling it Contra instead? This game is pretty slow and nowhere near as good as the first two games. Honestly though, it's not as bad as many people make it out to be. It's not cheap either since it's relatively uncommon. Still, there are many worse games on the system that sell for an even higher price. Okay, okay, I admit, I missed some of the big ones, like Tetris, for example. Let's review it right now. This is Tetris on the NES. This is the version used at championships. Otherwise, well, it's Tetris. Boom, Tetris for GameStack. Thanks, Chris. Anyway, let's take a look at some more games. Some of them are well known, others not so much, but all of them are interesting. Well, at least they are to me. Off from Data East is another game that I was first introduced to by watching videotapes that friends from school made me. This is a port of an arcade game and you play as a fat Russian dude who naturally breathes fire. You're on a mission to collect all of the letter K's that you can because that is what Karnov loves doing. My name is Karnov and I like the letter K. I don't know why I said that, that wasn't even a Russian accent, oh well. Lots of weirdos are out to stop you on your quest. This is one of those games where you need to be really fast on the button and rapid fire would help, but I just press the B button really, really fast. You can collect items that affect your status and firepower as well as give you abilities. Like a ladder to climb up if you want. Whee! Or a bomb to lay down which will explode when enemies touch it. The collision detection isn't good at all and the game moves really slow. That means this one can be pretty tough, but you know what? I never get frustrated. It's fun to keep trying again and again. The graphics aren't that colorful or detailed, but I do like some of the background designs and even the bosses. The music is extremely catchy and I love it, despite there not being very much of it at all. This is a really fun game to try to power your way through. This is Russian Attack from Konami. Get it? Because it sounds like the Russians are attacking and you've got to kill them all? I guess this made sense during the Cold War days. But actually, you're invading their space to destroy their secret weapon. You're rushing in and attacking, so the title is actually accurate. This one or two player simultaneous game is a run and knife. Get it? Instead of a run and gun? Yeah. So your main weapon is your knife, which means you've got to take out enemies at close range. You can also jump, but you need to press up to do this, and that means it can be tough to control. Honestly, it's not that bad once you get used to it. When you kill certain yellow enemies, a weapon will sometimes drop. This can be a bazooka or a grenade or even an invincibility star. The bazooka is awesome because it can take out every enemy on a horizontal line. Since this is a port of an arcade game, you die in one hit. Not only that, but it sets you back a ways to a checkpoint. That can make the game seem pretty tough. But even so, it's still really fun. Basically, you need to learn how each type of enemy behaves. You need to know which ones will jump at you because those guys are dangerous. You also need to know which ones will run safely past you if you're on a different level and which ones will climb up and down ladders to get you. The stages themselves can be tough, like here where these guard towers keep shooting at you while these enemies on the ground keep running in. The presentation isn't anything special, but it's certainly not a bad looking or sounding game. Legend of Kage from Taito was always a game I kinda liked. 
Of course, I called it Legend of Cage back in the day. Everyone did. I played it in the arcade, but all of my friends who had an NES never owned this one. So the one time I was allowed to rent an NES from the video store, this was one of the games I rented. And I don't care what anyone says, I enjoy this game. In the beginning, you're just chilling in the trees doing who knows what while your babe is hanging around on the ground. Then she gets kidnapped! Of course, being a mighty ninja, you've gotta rescue her. You can throw stars and slash with your katana, but honestly, I find the stars the most reliable weapon. You work your way to the left and you can jump super high and grab onto trees. Sometimes you can get power-ups which will make your attack stronger for a short time. The next stage, you're still moving towards the left. I like how you can hide in the water to avoid attacks. Here, you need to kill a certain number of blue ninjas to beat the stage. Pretty easy. Then you're jumping up and up to the top of the wall to the castle where your babe is held. This part is pretty fun. Then you're inside the castle, killing tons of bad guys and going up the stairs to many different levels. Eventually, you find your babe unguarded and you rescue her, as you do. But only seconds later, she's kidnapped again! What the hell, guys? Both the graphics and the music are really simple, but they work for me. I really like the main melody, and it stuck in my head for a few days after I returned that rented NES system. This is great fun, for me at least. In 1990, Taito released Demon Sword. This is basically a spiritual sequel to The Legend of Kage. In fact, it controls the exact same way with your stars and your katana. Except this time, the katana is a demon sword and is absolutely the stronger attack. This is a more fleshed out game designed specifically for the home market. As such, it has a bit more substance. Like having your sword grow a bit each stage and getting more and more powerful. Though there are still items in each stage that can make you briefly more powerful. Some items can be collected and stored, then selected on the pause screen. Then, you can use them as you play with a press of the select button. You now also have a life bar instead of a one-hit death. And you can get keys to go into rooms. Inside these rooms may be an item or even an enemy to fight. The stages are now meant to be explored, at least to a limited degree. The graphics are definitely more tile-based and everything looks like it was built out of squares instead of the slightly more organic look of Kage. The music sounds better as far as sound quality goes since it's not so high-pitched, but the composition here really isn't anything special. Overall, this is a really interesting game that I didn't even know existed until recently. Well, I knew about the title, but I didn't know it was a spiritual sequel to The Legend of Kage. If I did, I would have played it much sooner. It's a good game, but I still feel Kage was more fun. Okay, Zombie Nation from Kaze and Meldak is interesting to say the least. This is a horizontal shooter, but it's far from ordinary. Evidently, a meteorite crashed into Earth. Seemed harmless enough, happens every day. But this meteorite turned out to be an evil alien called Darkseed, and now he's turning all of America into zombies. He's also brought the Statue of Liberty to life to help him with his evil deeds. But you are the great head of the dead samurai Namakubi. And once you hear of this, all you can do, of course, is to go to the United States and rid the country of this evil menace. I mean, what else is a rotting, dismembered head to do? Stories in video games really don't get much better than this. I prefer it over Final Fantasy VI's story, and so do you. You control this giant head and you shoot eyeballs and vomit to defeat your enemies. And I guess destroy the United States in the process. The enemies are everywhere and they are hell-bent on taking you down. You have a life bar and only one life with a handful of continues. Good luck, because this game is crazy tough. Your shots are just about useless. You can upgrade them slightly by catching the helpless people falling out of the background. I guess these guys aren't zombies? They can be found by shooting buildings and even hidden inside solid rock. How did they get in there? The controls suck big time. Imagine a shooter that had an ice level and you're slipping and sliding all over the place. That's what this entire game is, though some stages seem to be more slippery than others. You keep moving for up to a second after you let go of a direction. This makes it hard to aim your shot and even harder to dodge enemy attacks. 
But man, those graphics are really good and the sound is even better, with lots of beefy effects. Not a great game by any stretch of the imagination, but it's unique and it really stands out. We really do need more games that are just crazy. The Nintendo Entertainment System sure has a lot of different kinds of games. Back then there was something for everybody. Hell, even today there's something for everybody. Even racing game fans! Can you believe that? Racing games! I like racing games. Rad Racer from Square was another game I rented along with the NES system back in the late 80s. None of my friends had it and I was really curious since I was a big fan of Sega's OutRun. To my surprise, this game had two things that the Master System version of OutRun didn't have. First was the parallax scrolling in the background. That's pretty cool. The second thing was smooth hills. Why couldn't OutRun do this? It made me feel like Sega wasn't even trying. Still though, aside from those two things, this game is far inferior to the 8-bit version of OutRun. You'll often get behind a row of cars which you absolutely cannot pass. You need to constantly hold up on the D-pad to engage your turbo if you hope to make any of the checkpoints. This will make your thumb start to hurt after a single course. This also makes the screen shake which I don't find appealing. You'll have to watch this video at 60 frames per second to see this effect if you don't already know what I mean. The music is okay. You select it by pressing down on the D-pad as you're racing and cycling through three tunes or just car noise. And let me tell you, you'll accidentally be changing that music a lot, especially as you turn. Not only that, but you can engage the 3D mode for the red and blue glasses that come with the game. One thing I like is being able to coast forever after I run out of time and actually being able to make the checkpoint just before I'm about to stop, only to make it and keep going. It was really interesting to see what I felt was Nintendo's answer to OutRun, and even though it doesn't quite match that in my opinion, it's still a good game. Three years later, Square released Rad Racer 2. I didn't even know that this one existed until probably a decade or two later. This is basically more of the same, though it's a bit more polished for sure. Before each stage, you can now choose from two different musical tracks or silence. One of the tunes is actually pretty good. You still need to hold up almost the entire time, but at least the screen doesn't shake. I feel they did a better job with the color and especially the background detail on this one as well. Though the car now slides around on the bottom of the screen instead of staying fixed to the center like proper racing games do. Not really a big deal though. You still get to have plenty of trouble with the evil enemy cars. It's a decent game, but I think the most interesting fact, at least for me, is that it even exists. Kid Nicky from Data East and Irem is such a stupid game. My stupid friends made me watch them play this. Just look at Kid Nicky, he's so stupid. Look at this stupid boss and his stupid cheeks. Look at the stupid enemies, they're so stupid, just look at that. Look at this one, he can't find a way out of that situation, he's stuck there forever. And listen to how stupid the music is. Ah, that's okay, I love it all. You are Kid Nicky and you are a radical ninja. You spin your sweet blade to defeat the enemies. It's pretty basic to say the least, but it's fun. You can get an occasional power up which will enhance your attacks for a brief time. I really like this one where anything that dares touch me dies immediately. This game can seem pretty challenging since it has one hit deaths, but honestly, it's actually pretty easy once you get the hang of it. You'll beat this game in no time. But even if you can't, there's unlimited continue so you can keep trying. I like how when you fight a boss, your blade flies away when you get a hit. That means you need to go get it and you're vulnerable in the meantime. Some bosses require a touch of strategy. And is this boss a Kabuki? I talked about Kabukis in the last episode. 
The graphics are nice but simple. In fact, some parts of the game may be a little too simple. Sometimes I notice that the status and stuff at the bottom of the screen messes up because that's just asking too much to keep it in place, I guess. Anyway, check this game out, it's pretty fun. Japan even got Kid Nikki 2, known as Kaiketsu Yancha Maru 2, for the Famicom. This one has stages with all sorts of different themes, like a Halloween theme, a train theme, a food theme where McDonald's fries try to kill you, stuff like that. Gone are the one-hit deaths and you now have a small life bar. You can even turn into a bird and other things. It definitely feels more grown up and more evolved, but it's still pretty easy for the most part. It doesn't end there though, because Japan even got Kaiketsu Yanchamaru 3, or Kid Nikki 3, again on the Famicom. Don't be too jealous though, as this is the worst one yet. You now have a bow instead of your blade. You can use it to bounce off of vertical surfaces to get to higher areas. Sounds fun, right? Well look how damn choppy this all is! Couldn't they afford to use one of the MMC chips or something? This one also has you grabbing keys to unlock doors. Not to mention, the music is pretty bad. The enemies are just as stupid as they were in the first game though. We didn't miss much by not getting this one localized. Gauntlet was another game that, you guessed it, I first experienced by watching a videotape made by a friend. Tengen ported the arcade game home and originally it was licensed by Nintendo though Tengen would eventually make unlicensed copies of the game once their feud with Nintendo started. You choose from a few different characters and then run around the maze destroying enemy generators while looking for the exit. If you don't destroy the enemy generators, well, they'll keep generating enemies. There are also keys to grab which make walls disappear. One thing that I like about this one is that it moves pretty quick and it feels very responsive. And the thing that really makes it for me is the music and sound. The music is super catchy and I even love the muffled voices. These were fascinating to me at the time because when the Master System did voices, they were harsh and scratchy, so this is quite a stark contrast in comparison. Be sure to try out this version if you haven't. This is Vice, Project Doom from Sammy, the same company who would eventually go on to buy Sega. Isn't it always amazing how these tiny nobody companies end up buying the big giant ones? Anyway, this is mainly a side-scrolling action platformer. You have a sword for your main weapon and it's really fun to use. But by using the mighty select button, you can cycle through two other weapons for long range attacks. The first is a gun that shoots maybe only 15 feet away if that. I think I'd be taking that one back and asking for a refund but it still can be handy sometimes. The other is a bomb which you toss in kind of an arc and it goes much further. You gotta make sure your target is within the arc of your throw though. Each of these long range attacks needs you to pick up extra ammo as they don't come in unlimited amounts. But ammo is always easy to find. You also sometimes have to slice down obstacles in your way in order to get by. But be careful because sometimes these obstacles will grow back and they'll hurt you if you touch them. The jumping feels pretty smooth as well. However, it's really easy to come in contact with an enemy, but fortunately you have a pretty generous life bar. This game also has exciting cinema cutscenes between each stage with plenty of riveting dialogue written by the best literary masters of our time. But what's more is that this game has a few different styles of gameplay. You start out in an overhead car scene which is very reminiscent of Spy Hunter. Another one is a side-scrolling first-person style shooting game which feels like it could make good use of a light gun. There are two of this type of stage as well as two of the driving stages in the game. The rest is all side-scrolling. The graphics are generally really good with some nice parallax here and there. There are also lots of these hopping Chinese vampires. I don't know, hopping vampires seems silly to me. Why do they hop? Dracula is way scarier and he doesn't need to hop. The music is pretty good too. You really can't go wrong with this one and it offers plenty of challenge over 11 stages.
Games on the NES were often very experimental. They took a lot more chances back then than they do these days, at least outside of the indie scene. And one of those experimental games really clicked with me in a big way. Blaster Master by Sunsoft is another one that I have a ton of nostalgia for. Yes, it's another one of those games that I first experienced watching a videotape full of NES games made by my friend Tom. And you're also probably wondering, is this the actual videotape that we're watching right now? Same question for all the other videotape games I've shown in this episode. Did I really keep the tape that long? The answer is, nope. See? You can't trust anything anymore these days, can you? Anyway, I can't tell you how many times I watched that Blaster Master segment on that tape. I was enthralled with the concept as it was unlike anything I'd really ever seen before at the time, and the music instantly hooked me. By the time I finally got around to playing it myself, I already had the first two stages memorized and knew exactly what to do. The game is by no means easy though. The worlds are huge maze-like things and I'm usually not too keen on mazes. These can be memorized pretty quickly though, or you can be a cheater and subscribe to Nintendo Power. That's what cheaters do. I'll be honest though, I wouldn't feel too badly about using Nintendo Power to guide me through this one. As you roam around in your tank, there's lots of places that you can enter by making the little guy hop out. He can run, jump, swim, and shoot. Once you get inside, it turns into an overhead view and you search for the boss. The problem is that a lot of these areas don't yield any decent results at all, so you need to work your way back out and go to the next one and hope the boss is there. There's also some backtracking in this game, sometimes even going all the way back to Area 1. Regardless, this game really made me respect Sunsoft and the NES. There's just so much variety in the games on this machine. Not much love is often given to Crystallis by SNK, creators of the Neo Geo. Have you ever wanted your Zelda to have more RPG? Or your RPG to have more Zelda? Well, here you go. In the beginning, you wake up and seem to be some sort of robot, maybe? You're a purple dude or dudette. I can't really tell, but you is what you is. You get your sword in the first town and enough money to buy some armor. That's right, you have a typical RPG town where you can buy better equipment for yourself. After equipping it all, you'll see that the action is like a very slippery Zelda. You attack with your sword to defeat enemies roaming the map. You can also hold down the button for a charge attack which has multiple levels which you unlock later. The enemies pretty much always drop a coin for you to grab and trust me, you'll want that. Once again, just like a real RPG, you gain levels. And yes, it can be a touch grindy trying to get experience and money in the beginning, but it's not horribly bad. The control and combat is absolutely nowhere near as refined as Zelda, however. You move fast and feel slippery and the enemies all move in very unpredictable patterns. This makes it extremely easy to bump into them and lose some life. In the beginning I got stuck because I was supposed to start this windmill but I couldn't. I had no idea what to do. I probably should subscribe to Nintendo Power. You can also learn and equip magic like being able to heal yourself with the press of a button. Or new powers like blowing through certain walls. It truly feels like pretty much any game on the Neo Geo. The menu takes some getting used to as using items can be kind of cumbersome. You need to engage the item and then come out of the menu and press the button to use it. Saving and loading your game also has a similar level of wonkiness. The visuals are good, but perhaps a step below Neo Geo quality. I do like this part where you go under a bridge. Pretty good for the NES, but I bet you the Neo Geo could probably do that too. The music is pretty good. Not some of the best on the system, but it's definitely worthy. The game is really fun once you get used to it with lots of things to discover and areas to explore. Definitely give this one a chance. On the flip side is Star Tropics. If Crystallis was too slippery for you, well then you're gonna love this because it's really stiff. You land at Sea Island one day for vacation and find out that your uncle, Dr. Jones, has been kidnapped by evil aliens. Now only you can save the entire universe. To help out with this, the chief gives you the village yo-yo. Gee, thanks chief. And that's your main form of attack in the Zelda-like dungeons. Except here you need to jump on boxes and press buttons. You move very slow and you hesitate for what seems like forever anytime you change directions. It doesn't look as long as it feels like when you're watching this though. 
Eventually, you'll get some projectile attacks which aren't unlimited, so don't turn on that rapid fire switch. You also take on other missions as you're looking for your uncle, like locating a missing baby dolphin. I mean, come on, this is a dolphin, your uncle can wait. Some areas seem really cryptic at first, like this island, but if you look closely at the graphics, you'll see what's what and figure it out. Or you could just subscribe to Nintendo Power. Just know that some obstacles can be passed through even though there's no visual clue. The game is quite linear, but that doesn't mean it can't be good. And for the most part, it is pretty good. I really wish my character was more responsive at turning though. Since this game hides things that are revealed by jumping on green blocks, you'll find yourself jumping on every green block you see in the game, just in case. Whether that's a good or a bad thing is up to you. One final small gripe is that using magic items is weird because you need to pause the game and press up or down, and that feels really awkward in battle. This one employs an autosave feature that occurs at the beginning of any significant event. Since there's no experience to gain, it resembles Zelda more than a traditional RPG. The visuals are nice, if a bit basic, and the same can be said with the music. The game is still worth checking out though. Four years later, Nintendo brought us Star Tropics 2 Zoda's Revenge. This game takes place only a few months after the original and involves some revenge by Zoda. Most of the things I said about the first game carry over here with a few changes. You don't start out with a yo-yo, in fact you don't start out with anything. But your first real weapon is an axe that you can toss. It has about the same range as the yo-yo, but you can't pick up dropped items with it. The controls are still a little bit stiff, but they have been vastly improved. You turn around much more quickly and everything feels more responsive. You can also move diagonally now and even attack diagonally. I love that. This game isn't obsessed with green switches either, which is a relief. However, there are some puzzle elements and you'll have to memorize some stuff. Get it even slightly wrong and guess who gets to do the entire dungeon over from the very beginning? That part's not too fun, but the first game did similar stuff if you take the wrong exit from a cave, for example. I feel that the graphics have been upgraded a little bit, but still aren't mind-boggling or anything. The music, though, is much better this time. However, the alarm sound that you get when your life is low is much worse. Still, all around, it's a nice improvement on the original. And there you go, that was every single game ever released for the NES, bar none. Well, except for the ones I didn't talk about. And I'm sure you'll let me know which ones I should have included in this episode. What? How can you have an NES episode without Felix the Cat? Oh my god. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, blah, blah. All I know is that this video game console changed the market, in my opinion, for the better. I mean, it wouldn't be the same without it. Anyway, what are your thoughts on the console? And let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Does playing with classic controllers make you feel like you're tangled in wires? <laughs> well, why not swap out the insides of your controllers with the 8-Bit Do internal wireless controller replacement parts? Isn't it called 8-Bit Do, though? No, it's 8-Bit Do. 8-Bit Do. 8-Bit Do. Well, that's stupid. You're stupid. Well, screw this. I hate them already. I'm going back to the wires. Wait, no, no, we got a controller to sell.
Hello and welcome to GameSack. Gonna check out the Evercade today. And this thing just showed up in the mail a few days ago with a whole mess of games. And it surprised the hell out of me. Turns out that I have a bunch of emails about this that I didn't read. I'm sorry about that, but I really wasn't gonna cover it. But then I thought, let's see what the Evercade is all about. So let's take a closer look at the system itself. Evercade is a handheld system made by Blaze Entertainment who are based in the UK. You can play games on the built-in 4.3 inch widescreen display or on your TV in 720p by using an HDMI cable. As for the controls, it has a Super Nintendo style layout with a diamond configuration and two shoulder buttons, though the names of the buttons are in different places. The system uses interchangeable game cartridges with multiple games on each. I do like the plastic clamshell cases as well as the fact that manuals are included with them. There are two versions of the Evercade. The lowest cost one is 80 US dollars and includes just one game. The premium version costs $100 and it comes with three games right in the box. Each game cartridge is advertised as selling for $20 each. The system also comes with a USB charging cable. On a full charge, they claim about four to five hours of battery life, which isn't a ton. However, based on my tests, that is pretty accurate. The system does not, however, come with a mini HDMI cable that you'll need if you wanna play games on your TV. Internally, the Evercade is using a 1.2 GHz Cortex A7 ARM processor for its emulation duties. The screen resolution is 480 by 272 pixels, which is the same as a Sony PSP. Provided is a menu button which allows you to set the brightness for the built-in screen as well as select if you want to play games in the original size or stretch to 16x9. During the gameplay, the menu button can give you a few more options. First and foremost are the save slots. You can also adjust the picture size as well as exit back to the main menu of the cartridge. As for the quality of the game screen itself, it's fine. I mean, the colors generally look pretty good. But since it has non-integer scaling, there's a bit of shimmering during the scrolling on pretty much every game. Fortunately, it seems to be a fairly quick screen as I don't notice much blur at all. Playing via HDMI is much preferred in my opinion. Unfortunately, there are no scaling options. So that means you'll get varying pixel sizes due to the non-integer scaling, and again, shimmering in the scrolling. The emulation is mostly fine. The Genesis emulator is called Blastum, which is a cycle-accurate emulator on the PC, which I've personally never tried. What's cool though is that it was ported to the Evercade by the emulator author himself. Sadly, this particular emulator is extremely blurry, especially when you're connecting it via HDMI. I can't seem to find any information on what other emulators are used here. The sound emulation is mostly okay, but there are some issues which I'll get into when I talk about the games. From what I understand, the emulators reside on each cartridge itself, so it's possible for a set of games to use a newer and better emulator in the future. Going back to the controls, you can't change the defaults at all. For example, NES games use these two buttons, and I'd rather use these two. The Genesis uses A, B, and Y. Playing Genesis games on any controller with a diamond configuration like this is usually not the best experience. As for the buttons themselves, they feel pretty good. Even the D-pad is nice. I do not enjoy how the menu button is right below the D-pad, however. It's extremely easy to accidentally hit during gameplay, especially when you're playing a fighting game. I've also accidentally hit the start button, which is below the 8 button. It's really easy to do. These buttons should all be lower. I do like how the power switch is an actual physical switch instead of the push and hold nonsense that we usually get these days. Okay, let's keep in mind that this is a relatively low cost device, so we can't go in expecting something like the PlayStation Vita, which still doesn't have ideal button and stick placements. Anyway, let's check out all of the games I received for this system. Atari Collection 1 comes with every version of the Evercade, so let's start here. This has 20 games on it, including Centipede, Adventure, Alien Brigade, Asteroids, Missile Command, Crystal Castles, Food Fight, Desert Falcon, Motor Psycho, Canyon Bomber, Gravitar, Double Dunk, Ninja Golf, Steeplechase, Night Driver, Tempest, Video Pinball, Aqua Venture, Yars Return, and Sword Quest Earthworld. All of these are original Atari 2600 and 7800 games. The ones that originated in the arcade are represented by the 2600 versions here. Most of these games were before my time, and although I played Atari as a kid, I always enjoyed the games that were in the arcade about a hundred times more. So most of the games that are on this cartridge don't personally appeal to me very much. 
The A button acts as the button in the Atari 2600 games. But be careful, pressing the X button resets the 7800 games and it happened to me more than once because I'm an idiot. Yara's Return is on here which was released in 2005. My favorite game on this collection is probably Ninja Golf for the 7800. You hit the ball and you have to deal with ninjas and frogs and other evil things on your way to wherever the ball lies. As a golf game, it's actually not bad. As a ninja game, it kind of gets boring quickly. Interplay Collection 1 comes with the premium version of the Evercade. It has six games including the first Clay Fighter, Earthworm Jim, Battle Chess, Boogerman, Incantation, and Titan. Clay Fighter is the Super Nintendo version and it's not the tournament edition unfortunately. And it plays fine on the Evercade. Earthworm Jim is the Genesis version. I feel this is much better than the Super NES version except for the controls provided here on the Evercade. Even when changing them in the options screen, I can't find anything that works well for this game as I can't set anything to the X button which severely hurts playability. The Super Nintendo version probably would have been preferred because of the control. But actually no, I'll get to that later. Boogerman is the Super Nintendo version and the controls are messed up too. Button A jumps and Button Y attacks. So imagine using your thumb like this for the entire game and no, you cannot change the controls. Incantation is a Super NES game where you control a little wizard. Once again, A jumps and Y attacks, which makes playing this one a huge chore. I think I might be able to get into this one a lot more if the button mapping wasn't horrible. Battle Chess seems to be the NES version, but I've never played any version before, honestly. Regardless, it plays fine, if a bit slow. Finally, Titan is an NES game which kind of is a more advanced take on Breakout and also less interesting than Breakout. This cartridge could have been a lot better, I feel. Data East Collection 1 is the third game included with the premium pack, and I love Data East. It includes 10 games, Bad Dudes, Burger Time, Midnight Resistance, Side Pocket, Karate Champ, Joe and Mac 2, Fighter's History, Two Crude Dudes, Magical Drop 2, and Burn and Rubber. Sadly, every game on here is the home version instead of the arcade. This is especially disappointing with Two Crude Dudes which went through significant downgrades during the port home. By the way, Two Crude Dudes started out sounding fine, but soon the sound changed to this. Restarting the game fixed it. And while I like the Genesis version of Midnight Resistance more than the arcade version, especially when it comes to the control and the sound, the Evercade button mapping practically ruins the game. I was able to sort of get used to it, but it's still not very optimal at all to be jumping with the Y button. They just didn't put much thought into porting these games, like at all. Side Pocket is the Super Nintendo version and it plays fine. I really enjoy this game. Joe and Mac 2 started out sounding fine, but soon the sound disappeared completely. Overall, there's just so much potential in this package, but they came up short by including the inferior versions of most of the games. And not to mention the horrible button mapping. Round two, fight! Techno's Collection 1 comes with eight games. Double Dragon, Double Dragon 2, Renegade, Super Spike V-Ball, Super Dodgeball, Crash and the Boys Street Challenge, Super Double Dragon, and River City Ransom. Double Dragon is the NES version and the first thing I notice is that the A and B buttons are backwards. The button labeled A on the Evercade is the same as the button labeled A on the NES pad. That is a huge flaw, but for this particular game, you can get used to it. Double Dragon 2, however, which is also the NES version, is almost completely broken because of this. On the NES, button B attacks to your left, and button A, which is to the right of button B, attacks to your right. It feels very natural. Here, it's backwards, so the left button attacks to your right, and the right button to your left. I can't believe that they didn't catch this, and I can't play it well like this at all. Of course, Renegade is the NES port as well, and it also suffers from these broken controls. This is a hard enough game as it is. River City Ransom works well enough despite the backwards controls. And that's a good thing too, because this is a great game. Super Dodgeball is here in all of its flickering glory and you can't increase the sprite limit on the Evercade. 
I like this game on the Neo Geo, but not really on the NES. And here's Super Double Dragon, which is a Super Nintendo game. This game has absolutely no audio. I rebooted it, and then suddenly it had sound. The Super NES emulation seems fine here other than the odd button placement, but that doesn't really hurt this game. And this is a pretty good game, even if it's slow and clunky. I think it might be my favorite one on the cartridge. Still, overall, I don't highly recommend Technos Collection 1. So as you can tell, I have quite a few serious issues so far. But this next collection might be interesting as it has a lot of forgotten games from the 8 and 16-bit eras. Let's check it out. Pico Interactive Collection 1 has 20 games on it. If you didn't know, Pico is a publisher that has been buying up rights to tons of old games, including overseas homebrew games and a few others that were never released. Included here are Switchblade, Dragon View, Top Racer, Power Punch 2, Brave Battle Saga, Eight Eyes, Nightshade, Radical Rex, The Humans, Dork and Imp, I think it's pronounced, Magic Girl, Water Margin, Iron Commando, Draken, Tin Head, The Immortal, Power Pigs of the Dark Age, Canon, Legend of the New Gods, Way of the Exploding Fist, and Jim Power, The Lost Dimensions. You remember Eight Eyes from the NES, of course. I mean, who possibly couldn't? The problem is, is, yep, you guessed it, the controls are now backwards. This seems to be an ongoing theme that plagues all games on the Evercade. Brave Battle Saga is an RPG for the Mega Drive which was translated. The title screen says Legend of the Magic Warrior and the splash screen says Brave Battle Saga. Oh well, whatever. Unfortunately, the game audio soon changed to this. Canon Legend of the New Gods is another translated RPG. This time, the sound went completely away just after starting the game. Jeez. Draken is a very early RPG for the Super Nintendo. I remember renting it and not liking it very much. Interesting that it uses a polygon landscape though. Its pseudo sequel called Dragon View is also here. This one is better and yes, it still uses polygons. It also has side view action sequences which have you jumping with A and attacking with Y. Ugh. Iron Commando is a fairly mediocre and kind of choppy Super Nintendo beat-em-up. Even the Genesis version of The Immortal is here. I'm just amazed that the NES version isn't here instead. The Super NES version of Jim Power is here and it still has the painful scrolling. Now I've heard that they plan to fix this for a future release, but they certainly didn't for this version. Magic Girl is an average vertical shooter for the Mega Drive. It kind of hurts my eyes sometimes with how choppy it can be, but it plays okay. The Genesis version of Radical Rex is on here. I doubt they wanted to use the space it would need for the Sega CD soundtrack, and that's fine, it's just Radical Rex. I started up some Genesis homebrew game called Switchblade. As I was trying to figure out what to do, the sound decided it wanted to fail. Tinhead is on here, and it's the Genesis version. There's not really much more to say about Tinhead that I haven't before. Top Racer used to be Top Gear on the Super Nintendo. I guess they had to rename it for one reason or another. I really like this game. Okay, check out the control setup I chose here. I use the bottom three buttons and have nothing selected for the top button of the diamond configuration. Will the game respect my desired control scheme? No. Gas is where I assigned it. Nitro is where I assigned it. But the brakes are button Y, which is at the top of the diamond configuration. It's like they go out of their way to break the controls for every single game. Water Margin is a homebrew game on the Mega Drive that plays like Knights of the Round from Capcom. We've talked about it before on the show. Next up is Namco Museum Collection 1. This has got to be good, right? Overall, it has a decent collection of games, I suppose. It has 11 titles, Galaxian, Pac-Man, Xevious, Mappy, Dig Dug, Star Luster, Battle Cars, Metal Marines, Libel Rabble, Quad Challenge, and Mappy Kids. Battle Cards is a Super Nintendo game that was only ever released in North America. Unfortunately, the sound failed soon after I started the game. And then the entire game completely froze. Lovely. Dig Dug is on here. I love Dig Dug, you can't go wrong here. Galaxian is also on here. Of course, these are the NES versions and not the arcade. 
I've never played Libble Rabble before, but here it didn't have any sound at all. Mappy Kids is here, and until now this game was only released in Japan on the Famicom. Unfortunately, the jump and action buttons are backwards here on the Evercade. Metal Marines is a Super NES strategy game, and yet another title that started up with no sound at all. Pac-Man is here, and of course it's the NES version. The Evercade could easily emulate the arcade, but I think it's because they already have an NES emulator and don't want to make an arcade emulator for each game here. I mean, it's a lot cheaper and easier that way. Quad Challenge is a slightly interesting Genesis game that I've always been slightly fascinated with. Slightly. Is Namco Museum Collection 2 any better? Well, at least the sound worked for the first time for every game on this one. This one also has 11 games. Pack Attack, Galaga, Warp Man, Dig Dug 2, The Tower of Druaga, Burning Force, Phileos, Weapon Lord, Dragon Spirit, Splatterhouse 2, and Splatterhouse 3. Of course, once again, it's the home versions where applicable. I've always kind of enjoyed Burning Force, and it plays well enough on the Evercade. I still don't like the music in Stage 2 very much, but the other stages make up for it. Pack Attack is an interesting puzzle game that can be pretty fun for a minute or two. Dragon Spirit is here and it's a great game. The NES version is good, but I kind of wish they had a PC Engine emulator for this one. A lot of people really love Weapon Lord, but I could never really get into it no matter how many times I try. The Super Nintendo version is represented here. Warp Man has you controlling what looks like a space dig dug shooting down a prerequisite number of enemies. And Phileos is as tough as ever. Okay, okay, I've accepted that all the games need to be the home version if they're based on an arcade game. Also, the best cartridge for the system is coming up in this next segment. It'll be the last collection of games I talk about. Next is Atari Collection 2, which has another 20 games. Basket Brawl, Yars Revenge, Solaris, Centipede again, but this time for the 7800, Asteroids, same deal, Demons to Diamonds, Desert Falcon, Haunted House, Sprint Master, Radar Lock, Millipede, Submarine Commander, Planet Smashers, Real Sports Tennis, Wizard, Air Sea Battle, Bowling, Street Racer, Dark Chambers, and Human Cannonball. Many of the same things that I said about the first collection can be applied here, but this one is definitely a lot more interesting to me. I was intrigued to see more 7800 games on here, like Desert Falcon, which is Atari's answer to Zaxxon. It was also fun playing the upgraded versions of Asteroids and Centipede. Basket Brawl kind of sucks though, as no matter how much I punch the other guys, I can't get the ball. I think somehow I was able to score though. It was probably my teammate that did it. Solaris is an interesting game released late in the life of the 2600. I remember seeing commercials on TV for this one, and I'm gonna have to read the instructions on how to play it so I can figure out what to do. Radar Lock is pretty ambitious for the 2600, but that's not surprising considering it was released in 1989. And of course, the classic, Yars Revenge, is on here. Now it's time for Interplay Collection 2, coming at you with six more games. Claymates, Earthworm Jim 2, Clay Fighter 2, Prehistoric Man, The Adventures of Rad Gravity, and The Brainies. I'll talk about Claymates and Clay Fighter 2 next week on a real Super Nintendo. Earthworm Jim is the Super Nintendo version. Will the controls be as I set them here? Of course not. The gun and weapon select buttons are reversed. You just can't seem to win here. Prehistoric Man is a Super NES game that might be interesting if the button mapping weren't messed up as a result of being on the Evercade. The same thing can be said about Rad Gravity here. The Brainies is a puzzle game where you need to match the colored fuzzball to the same colored disc. It's a pretty simple concept, and fortunately it doesn't suffer from any button layout issues. Overall, this cart really isn't much better than the first Interplay collection. Finally, we have Mega Cat Studios Collection 1. This one offers up 10 indie games. Coffee Crisis, Old Towers, Tanzer, Little Medusa, Super Painter, Multi-Dude, Almost Hero, 
Creepy Brawlers, Justice Duel, and Log Jammers. Almost Hero is on the NES and it's inspired by River City Ransom. The fighting action is kind of stiff, but I found the dialogue as you're fighting pretty funny. It seems like a good one to spend some time with. Creepy Brawlers is basically a boxing game like Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, except creepy instead. Coffee Crisis is a Genesis beat-em-up. You control baristas out to save the world from aliens and people who are possessed. I really like the animation in this one, but sometimes the control feels a touch unresponsive. Justice Duel has you playing historical figures like Abraham Lincoln, who of course is a robot. You basically just shoot down enemies. I got bored pretty fast with this one as there's not a lot of variety. Log Jammers is an NES game that seems to be inspired by Wind Jammers on the Neo Geo, except that this one is really twitchy and hard to play. Little Medusa is a Genesis game where you need to turn creatures to stone and then push them so that they make bridges. Then you collect the stars to complete the level. One hit and you need to start all over again though, and it's really easy to get hit. As a result, I didn't care much for this one, but it shows potential. Multi-Dude is for the NES and has you pressing buttons to switch between two dudes to get to the exit. A much better game is Old Tower, which is similar but has an automatic dashing concept. This one is for the Genesis and you need to collect all of the coins before the exits light up. Sometimes you have to switch back and forth between dudes. I played this one for a while and I definitely recommend it. The music is really good too, so that helps. Super Painter is an NES game where you need to color the gray blocks by touching them and then proceed to the exit. Simple concept and I like it. You can jump over enemies as well. I played this one for longer than I thought I would. And last, we have Tanzer, where the audio messed up right away in the title screen. I really wanted to play this, so I restarted it. And the audio messed up again. Okay, gonna try once more. All right, third time's a charm, I guess. Anyway, this game is awesome. And look, I can actually assign the buttons the way I want on the Evercade, meaning that it plays perfectly here. Well, except for the aforementioned sound issues. You run along slashing enemies and collecting gold. The control is quite good. The graphics are on the minimal side, but still pleasant. The music is fantastic. I want this game on my real Genesis. You only get one life, and as I was taken back to the title screen, the audio did this. Yikes. Overall, I'd say that this was probably my favorite cartridge for the Evercade. And there you go, that's the Evercade for you. You know, I can forgive that they only have the home versions on here, and that helps keep the cost low, and I can even forgive the shimmering scrolling and the blurry Genesis graphics. What I cannot forgive is that they don't allow you to remap the buttons on a system-wide level. I mean, what the hell, that is a serious overlook. Hopefully this can be fixed with a firmware update, but I don't even know if that's possible. Anyway, what do you guys think of the Evercade? Are you gonna get one? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. You know, these Evercade cartridges kind of look like the cartridges that go into the Neo Geo Pocket Color. Well, you don't think. Whoa! Neo Turf Masters on the Neo Geo Pocket has never been so intense! Game! This metal slug on the Neo Geo Pocket being played on the Evercade! The Intense! That's right, I'm probably losing my mind. Oh well.
No big loss. Whoa! Hello and welcome to GameSack. A few months back I took a look at the Evercade console here and while it's certainly an interesting concept, some might say I was a little bit hard on it. Was I? I don't think I was. I mean, I reported it as I saw it. And if you want to watch that episode, well, the link is in the description, unless you're watching this on an app that doesn't let you see the description. Anyway, there has been a few firmware updates since I made that episode, as well as some new game cartridges, so I figured I could show you four of those new cartridges and every single game on them while using the new firmware. So let's get to this. First up is Xeno Crisis and Tanglewood. This cartridge only has two games on it, Xeno Crisis and Tanglewood, both for the Genesis. These are both fairly recent games made by indie developers. First up is Xeno Crisis from Bitmap Bureau. This twin stick shooter was originally released in 2019. You take control of a marine who needs to shoot down room after room of aliens. It controls similar to Smash TV or Total Carnage if you've ever played those on the Super Nintendo. Playing it with a Genesis controller is odd, but if you use the six button controller, it kinda worked okay. On the Evercade, the button layout is the same as the Super NES, so it's a natural fit. The options for the game don't even let you change the controller layout, mainly because you don't need to. You can change them in the game's own option screen, however. Despite it feeling more natural, I had a hard time with this one, maybe more so than I usually do. I don't know what it is, maybe I'm just rusty, I haven't played this one for a while. Regardless though, it's an amazing game with excellent music. Hopefully I'll cover the Genesis and Dreamcast versions more properly in the future. And I can only dream about getting the Neo Geo version. Tanglewood is a puzzle platformer from Big Evil Corporation, released in 2018. I can definitely say that this is a well-made and well-thought-out game, but it's really just not my cup of tea. You play as a fox who must do stuff to save the world or something like that. I get the feeling that maybe you're dreaming all of this because you just fall back asleep at the beginning of the game. Anyway, you need to push lots of stuff around and collect their powers and figure out how to get past all of the obstacles in each area. The menu for the game lets you reassign the Evercade buttons, thank God. I sure wish the music played more often than it does. If you like puzzle platformers, you'll probably enjoy this. Next is the Atari Lynx Collection 1. This one has 17 Atari Lynx games, many of them lesser known or even new games developed by indie studios. There's lots of stuff here, so let's start with Awesome Golf. Despite the title, this is not an awesome golf game, and the swing meter will take some time to master. However, I really do like the scaling graphics when you hit the ball. It's slow, but it could be worse, I guess. Basket Brawl is kind of a mess. You're trying to play basketball and fight all at the same time, and neither of these activities has done well here. It's very hard to tell what's going on. I don't like it. Crystal Mines 2 Buried Treasure is fun, though. You play as a robot trying to get all of the treasure in each area and then find the exit. It controls well and is actually quite fun. Not only does it have music, but it's almost good. Cyber Virus is basically a first-person shooter. Wander around and shoot the bad guys. Good thing you have a map to find them. After they're all dead and there's nothing on the map, enjoy the desolate, lonely world you're now stuck in because there seems to be no exit anywhere. I don't like it. Dracula the Undead reminds me of Maniac Mansion, only much, much worse. The control scheme is awful. I don't like it. Gordo 106 is okay. You play as a lab monkey freeing other lab animals. I feel that it could use some more thought in the level design, but it's still worth trying out, I think. I sure wish that the scrolling were smoother. Ishido Way of the Stones is a puzzle game. Try to match all of the stones. I didn't like it on the Genesis, and I don't like it much here. Though, honestly, I'd rather play this version over the one on the Genesis. Jimmy Connors Tennis is okay, I suppose. It plays a decent game of tennis with high quality voices. 15. All. 
Jimmy Connors may be a great guy, but Jimmy Connors tennis is no Pete Sampras tennis. Pete Sampras tennis! Loops is a puzzle game of some kind. I don't care much for puzzle games and I didn't care for this one. I guess maybe you're supposed to create a loop? I don't know and I'm not interested. Malibu Bikini Volleyball sure starts out promising. Yeah. But no matter what I do, I can't seem to hit the damn ball. I'm better at volleyball in real life than I am at this game and I suck at real volleyball. Mega Pack Volume 1 has lots of little nonsense like things in it or something. Like an LCD like minigame. It also lets you fiddle with the sound. Unfortunately, there seems to be no way to exit out to the game's menu. Power Factor is a mess. You float around like an idiot shooting nothing while avoiding hazards and collecting fuel. If you love loud white noise blasting in your ears, you'll love this game. Remnant Planar Wars is a 3D space shooter. You fly around trying to shoot things. The problem is, is that this is absolutely as fast as you can shoot. Yeah, I don't like it. Super Asteroids Missile Command are Lynx versions of the old arcade games. Honestly, these are both pretty fun for what they are. I prefer Missile Command over Asteroids, but they both kept me playing. Scrapyard Dog is a fun and challenging little platformer, if a bit primitive. The funny thing is that I had a much easier time playing on the Evercade than I did on a real Atari Lynx. Give this one a go for sure. Super Squeak seems to be a puzzle game. I'm roaming around changing the color of some blocks and then I enter a shop. I don't seem to have much money. I try to exit the shop, but then I'm told I don't have enough money. What the hell? I pick restart, and again, I don't have enough money to restart. I do not like this game. Finally, we have Zump, the final run. Here, you need to get all of the blue blocks, I guess. Then the stage ends, except for this one where I can't get them all or I fall off and die. Obviously, I'm missing something, but I'm just not really interested in this one. Overall, there are a few good games on here and several dumb ones. I definitely like being able to play the Lynx games on a screen that is much better than the original Lynx systems. But what I would like to see is some vertical Lynx games, you know, like Gauntlet 3, you're playing like this or, or maybe like that. But what I'd be curious is to see how they handle the HDMI output of such games. Anyway, let's take a look at the other two cartridges. The Atari Lynx Collection 2 features eight of the more well-known Lynx games. Blue Lightning is probably the best game on the platform. You fly a completely generic blue jet and shoot down generic enemies in the sky and on the ground. I was always blown away by the scaling graphics in this game for its time. I just wish it had some music. California Games just lets you play one of four different mini-games, none of which are particularly exciting. I like the variety, but I could never really get much into it. Checkered Flag is an F1 racing game, and it honestly doesn't have much to offer, at least not for me. This one could have been so much more. Chips Challenge is an awesome puzzle game where you need to guide Chip around to collect the computer chips. But you also need to collect certain colored keys or items to help you along your way. It can get pretty challenging, hence the name, and fortunately there's a password feature. Electrocop is a great tech demo of the Lynx's scaling capabilities which were cutting edge back in 1989. Seriously, even the Super Nintendo can't do scaling like this. Unfortunately, as a game, it's another one that I really can't get a whole lot out of because the gameplay could be designed a lot better, I feel. Gates of Zendikon is a slow horizontal shooter where not a whole lot actually happens. It's fairly easy as well. There are a ton of stages though, as well as a password feature. There's not a whole lot here that I would label as exciting. Todd's Adventures in Slime World is a neat little exploration game. Be sure to wash all of the slime off of you if you want to stay alive. This one will definitely keep you busy for a while. Lastly, we have Zarlur Mercenary. This is a vertical shooter that's fairly okay. You can zap enemies with a homing laser if you're close enough. You can also shoot little people on the ground, which is always fun. Other than that, it's pretty average. I also want to mention that when you're playing Lynx games in handheld mode, it takes up more than just the 4x3 area of the screen. So I guess it's good that the Evercade screen is a bit wider. If they ever get Game Boy Advance games on the thing, this would probably be really helpful as well. Finally, we have the Oliver Twins Collection, which has 11 games. 
Basically all Comerica NES games without a license attached, so no micro machines. I do not want to play this one. They absolutely love Dizzy to no end in Europe. Not so much over here. In North America, we tend to like good games instead. I think it's a cultural thing. Let's start out with Treasure Island Dizzy. First of all, I wish you could switch the A and B buttons around. I want to jump with the Evercade A button and use X as the action button. It really doesn't matter much though because I would still not like this game. Next is Wonderland Dizzy. This one has music that will tear your ears up in no uncertain terms. Maybe a bit better than Treasureland Dizzy, but I still don't like it. This is BMX Simulator. As someone who did a lot of BMXing in my youth, this does not simulate it very well. I don't like it. Now for Dizzy the Adventurer. Again, you need to pick up items and use them like Shadowgate or a point and click game. It's better than the others, but this still isn't my thing. Who wants to play as an egg anyway? This is Dream World Pogi. It's a very European platformer. It's not very good. Hey, what do you want me to do, lie to you? Here's the fantastic adventures of Dizzy. This is the fantastic one, huh? Okay, I don't like it. This one is called Firehawk. This is actually a good game if you can believe that. I know I'm having a hard time believing it. It's basically an overhead version of Choplifter. Fly around, destroy enemy stuff, free and rescue hostages, and then fly them back to safety. Not bad if I'm being honest. This is the best game on this cartridge, bar none. Next is Go Dizzy Go. This is an almost Pac-Man type of game where you need to collect the fruit and avoid or defeat enemies. Gotta say, this isn't awful or anything. In fact, it's probably the best thing Dizzy has ever been in by a long shot. This is as good as it gets, the high point of his career. Then there's Mystery World Dizzy. Damn is tough keeping track of all these Dizzy games. I'll make it easy on you, I don't like it. This one is called Panic Dizzy. Obviously it's some sort of puzzle game. Like I've said before, I'm not a huge fan of puzzle games. And sadly this one isn't doing much to help me appreciate the genre. Thanks, but I'll pass. Finally, we have Super Robin Hood. This one is okay, but nothing here is really above average at all. It's certainly better than any of the Dizzy games. Also, every one of the games on this cartridge appears blurry and you can't play without the fuzzy filter on top of the graphics. It goes without saying that I don't care much for this cart, but if you live in Europe, you'll probably want to buy two or three copies of this because you love Dizzy. You know, I'm just giving everyone a hard time, right? These games must have some merit to them, otherwise so many people wouldn't like them. But right now, today, is not really a day I want to spend with all of these games. The last thing I want to talk about is that the Evercade has been through a few firmware updates since the last time I looked at it. Using the newest one which came out recently, I have had no issues at all with the audio like I did before. The HDMI problems seem to be gone as far as I can tell. The newer firmwares also have some control options you can choose which helps a lot. Though I would still like to see it completely customizable if possible. There's also now a noise when you create a save state so that you know when it happened, and it also has a timestamp of sorts. The screen can also be set to a slightly brighter mode now. Well, there you have it. The Evercade is definitely made better by the recent firmware updates, unsurprisingly, and you should obviously install them if you have one of these things. It's still not perfect. I, like I said before, I wanna see more in the way of button customization. I'd like to be able to customize any button to any of the Evercade buttons, but it's a step in the right direction. I'd also like to be able to disable the various filters that are applied on top of the graphics and the various emulators. Like, I don't wanna see the Comerica games being so fuzzy. I don't know why I have to play them in a fuzzy way if I'm playing out the HDMI. But again, who knows what the future holds. What features would you like to see for the Evercade and what games would you like to see, you know, ported to this thing? Let me know and thank you for watching this short little bonus episode of GameSat. Welcome to GameSack. Today I'm going to take a look at the TurboGrafx-16 mini console. 
I realize that YouTube is probably overwhelmed with reviews like this, and for that, I do apologize, but I do want to take my own personal look at this thing. I was lucky enough to have the original TurboGrafx-16 back when it was available at retail, but I'll do my best to look at it from the perspective of someone who really hasn't messed with the console much, or at least until much later. But I'll also give my normal opinion as someone who's played with this stuff since it existed. With that said, let's start. Let's check out the packaging. Here's the box for the TurboGrafx-16 Mini. And here's the box for the real TurboGrafx-16. The reason why everyone likes the TurboGrafx-16 was because of this smiling guy. But he's nowhere to be seen on the Mini. This is heresy. This is probably because they no longer have the rights to use his image. But I would have loved it if they had found the kid and put his current old man face on the box. The shoes, pants, and hands have all been re-photographed. The back of the box shows you covers for all 57 games included with the system. Included in the box is, of course, the TurboGrafx mini console, a controller, an HDMI cable, as well as a USB cable for power. Here's the mini next to a real TurboGrafx. Hmm, it's not very mini, is it? Wait, it does say TurboGrafx-16 Mini on the box, right? Yeah, sure does. Hmm, maybe I'm not familiar with the definition of Mini? You'd think in 2020 we'd have the technology to make it a bit, I don't know, Mini-er? Oh well. The system looks great as these Mini consoles always do. You have to remove the back cover to gain access to the HDMI and USB ports. Getting the USB plug inserted can be kind of a chore, but there are a couple of ways you can route it. One is out to the side like the original Turbo Graphics, or you can stick both the HDMI and the USB through the same hole coming out of the back. Either way, you're likely to leave these cables connected forever as it's not the easiest thing to gain access to them. The included controller is close but not quite identical to a real TurboGrafx-16 controller. It feels really good though, basically just like the real thing. It even has turbo switches. The select and run buttons are a bit more mushy, but all around it feels good in your hands. What's nice is that the cord feels about 20 times longer than the original cords, which were all way too short. On the front, there are USB ports for up to two players, but you can buy a USB turbo tap for up to five players. All right, let's get into the features of the console. You have your standard menu system and you can sort the games a few different ways. I prefer alphabetically myself. You scroll through the games in a similar fashion to Nintendo's classic consoles from a few years ago. At first, you're presented with the North American Turbo Graphics games. Down at the bottom, you can change consoles in order to see the PC Engine games. Scrolling through the PC Engine list, you'll see that there's a lot more here. However, some games like EaseBook 1 and 2 appear on both the Japanese and US side of the game selection menu. I really wish that the games were compiled into a single menu with a note at the bottom of the screen stating which region they're for, with maybe an option to switch the region if more than one exists. It's kind of dumb not to have the US version of some of these games in here to play. When you select a game, I really like how it inserts itself into the card slot. It's a really nice touch. For the CD games, the system card inserts and the disc spins up. I tried pressing select to go onto the menu here, which you can on the real system, but it's just for show here. Still cool though. There are also some super graphics games on here. They insert themselves into a core graphics or a PC engine, depending on how you have your options set up. I kind of wish it would have inserted into a super graphics. As for the CD games, they load decently fast, which is nice, but not quite as quickly as you might think they would. You can save your game on one of four slots at any time, which is a common feature in these consoles. You do this by pressing select and run at the same time to call up a menu and choosing a slot to save in. Then, anytime the game is running, you call up this menu again, choose which slot to load, and there you go. There are also options for your wallpaper. I prefer black myself. Like all of the mini consoles out there, the video output is 720p only. There are five different display options that you can choose from. The first is a 4x3 sized image, integer scaled three times vertically so there's a bit of black on the top and the bottom. Then there's the full screen 4x3 mode with no upper or lower bars. The pixel perfect mode results in no shimmering during scrolling for most games, but it's too skinny. There's also a stretched out widescreen mode with no black bars if that's your thing. Finally, there's a Turbo Express mode, which is cute, but come on, you're not going to use this. You can also apply fake scan lines on top of each mode, but they don't look very good. Actually, they do look kind of okay in the full screen 4x3 mode, but they didn't bother brightening up the game image, so it still looks wrong. Oh, and you can't enable the scan lines on the Turbo Express mode. <laughs> There's 
There is very slight shimmering during the scrolling on most games if you're playing in a 4x3 mode, but none if you're playing in the pixel perfect mode. This can vary by game. For example, R-Type has a higher horizontal resolution than the large majority of games, so no matter how you set this one up, you're going to get shimmering in the scrolling. The pixel perfect mode is only pixel perfect for games that are 256 pixels wide, but sadly defaults to the same aspect ratio for this game which is 336 pixels wide. The Japanese version is actually 352 pixels wide, but it has more flicker as a result, just FYI. This game is the exception rather than the rule though. Actually I don't notice any shimmering if you're playing on the Turbo Express mode, so I guess if it really bothers you, here's an option. The entire shimmering issue could have easily been solved with a simple horizontal interpolation filter. The video would be slightly softer, but almost imperceptibly so. If you don't notice or mind the shimmering, that's a good thing and you shouldn't let any of what I'm saying here dissuade you from enjoying the system. The sound itself is generally good in both card and CD based games. If you really want to get into the nitty gritty, then it probably doesn't sound exactly like a real system down to the same exact frequency response, but that's okay. The beauty of the PC Engine consoles is that it's generally easier to emulate accurately. I don't have any issues with the sound quality that are worth mentioning. What is worth mentioning though is the sound delay. Yep, it's back and it's just as bad as the Genesis Mini. The sound often occurs 7 frames after it was originally intended to occur if we're counting at 60 frames per second. This is more noticeable on some games than others. Here's Bonk's adventure on a real TurboGrafx-16. The sound occurs right as his head touches something. Here's the TurboGrafx Mini. Yikes. I don't know why this is such an issue with these mini consoles, but clearly it is an ongoing issue, no matter the platform. Again, if you don't notice this, or if it doesn't bother you, then hey, that's a good thing and you can ignore this observation. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, however. Another thing we need to talk about is the control. While the controller felt good in my hands before I used it, it does feel slightly stiffer than a real TurboGrafx controller during actual gameplay. Nothing extremely significant though, and maybe it'll loosen up over time. But is there any control lag? Yes, unfortunately there is. My friend Chris Tang tested this and found that it was between 3 to 5 frames behind real hardware hooked up to a CRT. I noticed myself dying quite a bit more on some games, and this is probably why. Again, a lot of these mini systems have this issue. Still, I was able to play most games decently well. For the most part, if you've been happy with the performance of the past Nintendo and Sega mini consoles, well then this one won't disappoint. On the flip side, if you've been disappointed with their performance, then this is the same story you're going to be disappointed here as well. Now on to the games. That's right, each and every one of them, and there are a lot of them. I promise not to spend too much time talking about each title because overall there are 63 of them to mention as there are some hidden games in there as well. Let's start out with the TurboGrafx-16 side of the console. There are 25 games selectable when you have it in the TurboGrafx-16 mode. All of them are based on the North American releases and are in English. Airzonk is a really fun shooter which is kind of based on Bonk. Everything here is excellent and it's a great inclusion. Gotta love the music too, unless you don't. Alien Crush is a really good video pinball game, but it's nowhere near as good as Devil's Crush, which is sadly not on here for some reason. Still, you can have plenty of fun with this one. But really, why this one instead? I want answers. Blazing Lasers is a nice overhead shooter that really stood out in its time. Its music and sound give this one a fairly unique feel, at least it did for me back then. Bomberman 93 is a good choice if you're going to include a Bomberman game. Lots of modes and options in this one, and it'll keep you busy. Bonk's Revenge is the second Bonk game, and it's probably my favorite. The sound delay really annoys me in this one though. Listen, his jump doesn't even start until he's nearly at the apex of his jump. Kadash is an arcade port from Taito, and it was localized by Working Designs. You collect money and level up, which adds a touch of RPG style gameplay to it. It's okay. I've certainly played much, much, much worse. 
Chu Man Fu is a puzzle game where you need to push the colored balls to the matching squares. I've got to be honest, I'm surprised how much I enjoyed this one. Be sure to give it a try. Dungeon Explorer is like Gauntlet for up to five players. It's a fantastic game that everyone should play, I'm, I'm gonna say six times, six times minimum. JJ and Jeff is a game that kind of plays like a cryptic version of Adventure Island. It gets better the more you get used to its weirdness and how it works. Lords of Thunder is an excellent CD shooter with amazing graphics and music. I hope you like collecting gems. There's a lot of shooters on here, just saying, and I wish Gate of Thunder was one of them. Military Madness is a super fun strategy game if you like such things. I do, at least this one. Give it a try. Moto Rotor is a racing game that's ruined because it's designed around multiple players. All five cars have to be on the same screen at once and it's bizarre and it's just not fun. Newtopia is a Zelda clone and a really good one. If you can deal with Link not being in the game, you'll definitely enjoy this. Newtopia 2 is another Zelda clone, but this one is more refined. Now you can walk diagonally, which is great. Still, Link's not in here, but I recommend it anyway. New Adventure Island plays a lot like Adventure Island, except new. In fact, I love how new everything is here. Even though the game is old, it's new. Unless you think the title screen is lying. So try out New Adventure Island, because this is the newest game on here. Okay, okay, I'll stop with that now. Ninja Spirit is an excellent ninja game that's short, but super fun and highly recommended. It's pretty much mandatory that this one is on here. Paris All Stars was one of Working Design's first localizations along with Kadash. It's one of those Taito games where you need to clear the screen and collect fruit. It's good, but not the best of these kinds of games I've ever played. Power Golf is a powerfully bad golf game, but hey, it has good music. Its inclusion on here is just a waste of power. Okay, there I go again. I'll stop, I promise. Actually, I don't promise. Psychosis is an interesting horizontal shooter with some trippy visuals here and there. It's definitely worth trying out. R-Type is an amazing horizontal shooter and a classic game, one of my favorite shooters. I love the creature designs, and the music in this version is my favorite out of any version anywhere. It takes a lot of patience, though. Soldier Blade is my personal favorite in the Star Soldier series. Fun power-ups and excellent music make it even more enjoyable. This would be a good time to talk about alternate versions. On some games, holding down the select button while you start it from the menu will give you an alternate version of that game. Soldier Blade is one of these and it gives you a caravan mode. This is basically a timed version where you try to score as many points as possible within that time. Doesn't sound like much fun, but it actually is. I'm totally stoked that they included bonus versions of some of the games on here. I'll mention each of them as I go through this list. Space Harrier is an awful looking port of the arcade, but it does try to be quite faithful on everything else. As a result, it gets a pass, but these days it's not for everyone. If you're not a fan of the game, this version probably isn't going to win you over. Splatterhouse is a great game that was included after people complain about it not being present. It's also the reason the box has a mature rating on it, despite this game being pretty tame overall by today's standards. Victory Run is a decent third-person racing game. I like messing with the car parts to help out in the race. I never cared much for the graphics, though, even when it was brand new. I don't know, it's just something weird about them. East Book 1 and 2 is a fantastic action RPG, but modern gamers probably won't be able to get over the bump combat and not pressing a button to swing your sword. Still an incredible game though, and I recommend you try to get used to the combat. It's easier to control than you think. Now for the PC Engine games. There's also a lot more hidden stuff on this side of the system, so let's do this. There are 32 games on the Japanese side, but sadly four of them are repeats from the North American side. First up is Akumajo Dracula X Rondo of Blood. I'm amazed and glad that this was included as it's one of the best Castlevania games of all time, bar none. All Dines is a horizontal shooter for the super graphics that's initially pretty tough until you get the hang of it. I wish the colors were better, but at least the music is pretty good. 
Gate Ball is actually just croquet. Not sure why this game even exists in the first place, much less was considered to be included here. Bomberman 94 is the follow-up to 93, and it's just more Bomberman action. Bomberman Panic Bomber is a CD game. This is one of those match three of the same type of thing puzzle games, but with the occasional bomb and stuff. Cho Anarchy is a horizontal shooter which reminds me of Wings of War slash Gynaug on the Genesis. But this is a much sillier game and it's pretty fun. Dai Makaimura is the Japanese name for ghouls and ghosts. This super graphics version is really good, of course. It's tougher than the Genesis version though, are you up to the challenge? Because I am. Dragon Spirit is a tough vertical shooter with cool power-ups and some really nice music. I'm surprised Dragon Saber isn't on here, actually I'm not surprised. Dungeon Explorer is here and it's the same, just with a bunch of Japanese text instead of English. Fantasy Zone is here as well. It's a fun, kooky game, but I'm not sure why they included the Japanese version, but the good news is that it doesn't matter because everything is in English. Fantasy Zone is another game that has an alternate version if you hold the select button while choosing it from the menu. The graphics and sound have been given a complete overhaul and are much better, but they are still within the confines of the PC Engine console. This is really cool, but unfortunately it's quite buggy if you die. I died once in stage 2 and was resurrected in stage 1 with only two of the bases destroyed. What the hell? Still, it's cool to mess around with. Galaga 88 is known as Galaga 90 in North America. It's the best Galaga game there ever was or ever will be. I love it. Sapphire, for short, is a vertical shooter that required the high memory arcade card to play. It's a great game, but not as good as some of the other shooters on the console. The original Gradius is here. This one is more fun than you'd think the first game in the series would be. Hold select and you get an alternative version of Gradius that's closer to the arcade. The graphics are a bit better, but honestly I feel that the sound is a big downgrade over the regular PC Engine version. Gradius 2 Go For No Yabo is the sequel. This CD game is much improved, but be careful because it's a lot tougher. Necromancer is a Japanese RPG, I think. Why is this on here? Seriously, the TurboGrafx-16 Mini was targeted for North America. This makes no sense, it has no business being here. Nectaris is simply the Japanese version of Military Madness with Japanese text, as you'd expect. Natopia is on here in case you hate being able to read it. No, your save files from the US side won't work over here. Same story with Natopia 2. Same game, but with Japanese text. Ninja Gaiden is a fun surprise to see on here. It's basically a port of the NES game with more color, but also eye-piercing scrolling that nobody ever wanted. Still, if you love the NES game, this one is absolutely worth playing. If you press both the 1 and 2 buttons simultaneously at the title screen before you begin, the cutscenes will even be in English. Pretty cool. PC Genjin is the Japanese version of the original Bonk's Adventure. Again, I'm not sure why this is on the Japanese side of a product targeted towards North American audiences, especially when he's the console's mascot. This makes no sense at all. Salamander is a really cool shooter from Konami you might know as Life Force. I like this one a lot. Even better is the alternate version of Salamander that's on here. This one adds voices for the power-ups which makes it more like the arcade. The graphics and music have also been beefed up a bit. Now's the time to mention the hidden games. Highlight Salamander and tap the select button twice and then begin the game. You get a game called Force Gear from Konami. This is really cool and everything is giant. This is a CD game despite it playing normal PSG music. It's still incredibly awesome though. If you highlight Salamander and tap the select button three times, you get Twin B Returns from Konami. This is mostly a game where you try to destroy bosses as fast as possible. It's kind of sparse. This minigame was originally unlockable on the CD game in Japan called Tokimeki Memorial, but that full game is only on the PC Engine Mini, not the Turbo Graphics Mini. Moving on, Spriggan is from the same people who made Musha on the Genesis. This is a great game, definitely better than Robo LS on the Sega CD. Snatcher is on here. Don't get excited, it's all in Japanese, sadly. 
本日付でジャンカーに任命されてきたギリアンシードだがギリアンシードさんスプリガンマーク2 is a side scrolling shooter where I feel your ship or robot or whatever he is moves too fast for its own good decent game otherwise though Star Parodier is basically Hudson's take on Konami's shooter parodies. This one is a parody of the Star Soldier series and it's fantastic. Super Darius is basically just the first Darius game on CD. Nothing exciting here at all, really, unless you're really into the first Darius game. This is Super Momotaru Densetsu 2. I can't even figure out what this game is, some sort of simulation, I think? Let's be real here, it has no place on this console. Super Star Soldier is another good entry in the Star Soldier series. It's not as good as Soldier Blade, in my opinion, but it's definitely worth playing. Some people even prefer this one. The Genji and Haiki Clans is an oddly named but interesting game. Yeah, what he said. I'm not very good at this version yet, but it looks like it could grow on me. The Kung Fu is known as China Warrior on the Turbo Graphics. You get to punch lots and lots of idiot hummingbirds and sometimes maybe even people. Who could ask for more? The Legend of Valkyrie is a nice overhead action game from Namco. I really wish this one had seen a US release because it's quite fun. Finally, Easebook 1 and 2 is on here just in case you desperately need to play it in Japanese for some reason. There you go, the TurboGrafx 16 Mini. Overall, it's a good introduction to the system's library, and if you just want a decent sample of the platform, then this is a good purchase. Overall, I don't feel that you miss out on anything significant by choosing the TurboGrafx 16 Mini over the PC Engine Mini. However, if you get the PC Engine Mini, you will miss out on Splatterhouse and Salamander, and you want them both because they are awesome. And I, like I said before, I think this could be much, much smaller, and it should be. A lot of people complain about the games that they included on this, but these mini consoles are really only meant to be a small taste of the platform's entire library, and there's no way they can include everything that technically should be on here. It's just, like I said, a taste. As for me, this is really more of a curiosity that will probably end up on the shelf soon, but the included bonus content on here was really surprising and really awesome. What do you guys think about the Turbo Graphics and or PC Engine Mini? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. The Turbo Graphics 16 Mini is cool, but you know what it needs to be a true winner? Falcon from Spectrum Frickin' Holobite! With Falcon, you can experience true aerial combat indistinguishable from reality. Falcon! Only Spectrum Holobite can push the Turbo Graphics 16 to the next level with up to 12 real polygons. 16 bit power! Falcon is the only software used to train all pilots, military and commercial. So Stupid! You don't even have Falcon! All you ever do is fail! You don't even try hard enough! I don't even know why I waste any time with you! You're so dumb! The TurboGrafx 16 Mini does have a croquet game, though. Hmm. Aim your shot and then hit the ball with the mallet! 16 bit power! The next generation of gaming is here! I'm sorry, TurboGrafx 16 Mini. I didn't mean to yell at you. I promise it will never happen again. I'm emotionally stable now. You forgive me, right? Hello and welcome to GameSack. At long last, I'm finally taking a look at the Sony PSP. That's because thanks to the so called PlayStation TV here, I'm actually able to get quality captures of the games. But before we take a look at those games, let's take a look at the Sony PSP itself. The Sony PSP. In 2004, Sony decided to enter the portable market with a powerful new system that was far ahead of anything on the market at the time. Launching in Japan at the end of 2004 and the rest of the world in 2005, the Sony PlayStation Portable, or PSP, was truly a powerful system. It was the first and only portable game system to use disc based media. 
The Sony Universal Media Disc, or UMD, was a proprietary format which could hold up to 1.8 gigabytes of data on a dual layer disc. Sony even tried to push the format by releasing movies on UMD. The system featured a wide 4.3 inch screen with a resolution of 480 by 272 pixels. The PSP Go, which was released in 2009, featured a 3.8 inch screen and lacked a UMD drive, requiring all games to be downloaded. The control layout is similar to a PlayStation 2 controller, but with only one set of shoulder buttons and a sliding analog disc in lieu of an analog stick. There's also a slot for Sony's proprietary memory stick to increase the amount of storage. The internal rechargeable battery allowed anywhere between 3 and 6 hours of gameplay depending on the game. You can also purchase video cables to play on your TV, but you need to make sure to get the right cables for your specific PSP model. The PSP is powered by two 333 MHz CPUs, a GPU running at 166 MHz and between 32 and 64 MB of RAM depending on the model. The Sony PSP was officially discontinued in 2014, selling about 80 million units with about 1300 games released worldwide. Alright, now that we know a little bit about the hardware, let's move on to the games. Now, these may look a little bit rough when they're blown up to full screen. I don't think they're too bad, but you might. If you want to see what the PSP really looks like, then watch this episode on a PSP sized screen, which, like I said, is about 4.3 inches diagonally. Anyway, on to the games. Hot Shots Golf Open Tee is the first portable entry of Sony's extremely approachable golf series. The strength of this series lies in how easy it is to pick up and play. You have your typical swing meter, but if you're close enough to the hole, it'll tell you the optimum power that you want. Everything is extremely well put together in this game, and it's very hard to stop playing. I seriously recommend it even if you don't like golf or sports games. The graphics are perfect for the handheld and move very fast and smooth. The music is upbeat if you enable it, but you don't have to. This is the perfect game to play if you're in a waiting room somewhere. Or you might even consider Hot Shots Golf Open T2. Despite being released three years later, this is pretty much just a slight upgrade of the same game. Even the music is the same. There's really no need to own both games, but if you want one and you have a choice, go for part two here. Do you like strategy RPGs? Then make sure to try out Jean Dark from level 5. You play as Jean, whose village has been destroyed by demons. You start hearing the voice of God, and an armlet affixes itself to you, giving you quite a bit of power. The story is loosely based on Joan of Arc, if you haven't guessed that already. In fact, the story is quite good and can be darker than a lot of other games I've played in this genre. The game itself plays like a 3D shining force. If you're familiar with that, you'll have no issue jumping right into this one. You have a certain amount of space each character can move. After that, you can fight if you're close enough to an enemy. Of course, certain characters can attack from further away than others. After all of the characters in your party are done, the enemy gets a turn. Of course, the game throws more at you than just the normal Shining Force stuff, like the armor Jean can wield if things go a certain way in battle. There's also a group shield that can happen, and more stuff like that. The control works well enough, though sometimes it's a bit cumbersome to navigate your cursor along the grid, but it's certainly nothing that'll make you pull your hair out. The stages can take quite a bit of time, and they get fairly big. Between the stages, there's lots of story to be told. Often you'll see anime cutscenes, and they look really nice. You'll also be able to buy things in the shop and equip your characters with new items and magic attacks. Each stage has a specific objective, so pay attention to your goals and also what you need to prevent from happening. The graphics are nice, if a bit grainy. The colors are all very well done. The music is adequate, and it certainly doesn't get annoying. Overall, this is a fun one, and it can be quite addictive if you enjoy these types of games. Prinny, Can I Really Be the Hero is an interesting 2.5D action game from NIS. You play as a creature who sort of looks like a penguin, but in fact you're the soul of a criminal and there's this whole lore around it from the Disgaea series where all this is from, which I've never played. 
The story is cute for about 15 seconds, but I'm here for the action. You're equipped with a double jump, a slash type of attack, a butt stomp to stun enemies, and an air attack. When you do an air attack, the camera angle switches and you attack downwards. You can turn off the camera angle switching if it annoys you. You have a total of 1,000 lives to get through this game, and you just might need them all. It's a tough game, but fortunately checkpoints are everywhere. The control is decent, but I feel it could be better. There's definitely some noticeable lag in the jumping, and sometimes I feel like I get stuck climbing up on a ledge while getting attacked. The graphics are nice for the system, and there's plenty of color. The music is excellent, and it really fits the action. Unfortunately, the sound experience is ruined whenever the printies talk, and they talk a lot. I got this, dude. They say dude a lot, and trust me, it gets old super fast and instead only serves to annoy you. What's with all the badass demons coming around lately, dude? I guess the developers thought it would be endearing. Maybe if it was just a single character that said this, it would be less annoying. However, each and every printy is a different soul, yet they all share the exact same personality. Oh well. At the end of the day, this isn't the best platformer in the world, but it's one I think you should try. Three years later, we got Prinny 2, Dawn of Operation Panties, dude. That's right, this time you're actually hunting down stolen panties. While the game's title and premise probably won't appeal to anyone who's mentally matured past 12 years old, the game is ever so slightly refined over the original. The controls are the same, but I swear they feel a hair better. There are also a few new things like an easy mode and enemies that spring you high when you bounce on them. It's also easier to enter into the break mode by filling your combo meter. But wait, there's more. They also added an ice stage as well as an underwater stage. These are stages that gamers absolutely love in their platformers. Other than that, it's literally more of the same and it's just as annoying with its personality. Once again, there are nice graphics and good music. Just be sure to try one of these out to see if you like Prinny. Hex's Force is a turn-based RPG from Atlas and Sting. Right at the start, you can choose from two different stories to play through, which will obviously give this title some replayability. I chose Cecilia's story. She's a cleric, and her town gets attacked and an artifact is destroyed. Now she needs to save the entire world. As far as the story goes, it's about average for an RPG. It's certainly nothing bad, but it's also not overly enthralling. As you run around, you can rotate the world with the L and R buttons, which reminds me of the Grandia games. The battles are thankfully not random as you see the monsters on the map as you wander around. The turn-based battles are mostly familiar, which is good in my opinion. Nothing overly complex. Moreover, they're fun to play and usually don't get repetitive. I really love the colors in this game, it looks nice. There's also a few anime cutscenes here and there to enjoy. The music has plenty of good stuff, but a few of the tunes do get kind of old after a while. It's not the best traditional RPG in the world, but it's certainly not bad. I'll show you what I can do! And As you can already tell, there's quite a variety of software on the system. It's like a mini PlayStation 2. Speaking of the PlayStation 2, some of the heavy hitters on that system got really cool portable versions. There are two God of War games on the system that I should mention quickly, even though we've shown them before. These are best described as cinematic action games. God of War Chains of Olympus was released in the first half of 2008. This is a high dollar production, and you can feel it. If you enjoyed the game on the PlayStation 2, then you'll enjoy this as the action and flow are pretty much identical. There are some quick time events, and you've got to be really fast. I kept messing them up, and when you do that, whatever enemy you're fighting will suddenly gain at least 25% or more of their life back. 
The graphics are great for the system, if not a little dreary. The frame rate is variable, which I'm never really a fan of, and there's some screen tearing. Overall, this is a good one if you enjoy the series. God of War Ghost of Sparta was released in late 2010. You can take everything I said about the first PSP God of War game and apply it here. It's more of the same. Except that this one is definitely more forgiving on the quick time events. For that reason alone, I prefer this one over Chains of Olympus. For me, each of these games are good to play through exactly once and then never play them again. Both of these have HD remasters on the PlayStation 3. <laughs> Ridge Racer was a launch game on the system. This is basically a greatest hits of the Ridge Racer series up to this point, featuring many tracks from the first four games. If you're familiar with the series, then you'll have little problem adapting to this one and you'll be drifting all over the place. Otherwise, it might take you a few laps to get completely used to the controls. The more you drift, the more nitrous you'll get for a speed boost. The graphics are really nice, especially considering it's a launch title. The music is mostly experimental techno and some of it's pretty good. Two years later, Ridge Racer 2 was released, but only in Japan, Europe, and Australia. Screw you, North America! This is more of an update than a true sequel, kind of like Ridge Racer Revolution was compared to the original Ridge Racer. You have some new tracks as well as the tracks from the previous games, all of them. There are also some additional music tracks as well. Once again, the graphics are really nice and run at 60 frames per second. The same announcer from the last game is back and he's just as excited. Overall, this is definitely the better of the two Ridge Racers on the PSP, but I do kind of wish it were more different than the first. Yeah! It's a new record! Two laps to go! Burnout Legends from Criterion and Electronic Arts was released in 2000, I mean 2005. This one plays mostly like its big console brothers, specifically Burnout 3 and Burnout Revenge. You race as a generic car, trying to come in first, all while crashing, causing others to crash, and generally just having a hell of a good time. You earn boost by taking risks such as driving on the wrong side of the road or bumping up against your opponents. The gameplay is all quite intuitive. There are other modes like Road Rage where you need to take down a certain number of other cars to proceed. There's even a pursuit mode where you're the cop and you're basically playing Chase HQ if you're familiar with that game. You ram the criminal's car again and again until he dies forever and ever. The graphics are really good, but they only run at half the frame rate of the console burnouts. The music is all licensed, most of it being pretty much garbage, with a few decent songs here and there. Burnout Dominator came out two years later. So get this, the game starts with a video that you absolutely cannot skip telling you how the game works, which isn't hard to figure out. I mean, come on, it's Burnout. It's one of the most simple games from that era. Taking risks while burning refills your boost bar. That's bad enough, but the first stage of the game is constantly interrupting you telling you how to play it, literally what the video just showed you. Criterion and EA must really think their customers are insanely stupid. A baby can figure this game out. Once you get past that nonsense, the game improves. Unfortunately, I don't feel it's quite as good as Burnout Legends. You start out in an old clunker doing drift challenges to earn points. Eventually, you get to a real race that has you on a big track with lots of speed and action. There are many different things you can try to achieve while playing other than just meeting the requirements of that particular race, like drifting for so many yards or whatnot. Think of it like trophies, just extra challenges. This game has the same quality of graphics as Burnout Legends for the most part, but the licensed music is actually slightly better. Except for Avril Lavigne, what is she doing on here? Overall, it's still a really good portable Burnout game.
There are two Wipeout games for the system. The first is Wipeout Pure. Sure, it's a poor man's F-Zero, but out of all of the poor man's F-Zero racing games out there, the Wipeout series is probably the best. This controls really well and it restored my faith in the series as I was really turned off by the controls of the original game. This is still floaty, but it feels smoother thanks to the analog disc thing. I still kind of suck at the game, but I suck a bit less at this one. The graphics are fast and smooth and the soundtrack is the European techno that we've come to expect from the series. A few of the tracks are actually even kind of good. Two years later, we got Wipeout Pulse. This one seems to have a higher production value. The tracks themselves are definitely more interesting in this one. It does seem to be slightly more difficult compared to Wipeout Pure. I'd prefer these games without the weapons as I don't really feel that they add anything of value. The weapon effects do look really cool though. This was released on the PS2 in Europe and you can also get both of these PSP Wipeout games upgraded in HD on Wipeout HD for the PlayStation 3. This is another good entry into the Wipeout series. Outrun Coast to Coast is even on the PSP. I'm amazed that they even attempted this at all. Back when this was released on the big boy consoles, I was super impressed at the quality of the graphics. And they still look fantastic on the PSP. What fun! Sure, the resolution and detail level is cut way down, there's more fog and the frame rate is variable, but at least there isn't much, if any, screen tearing. All of the game modes and music have made it over, so if you like Outrun, this will keep you busy for quite some time. And of course, you have Gran Turismo. This is one of those racing simulators that kind of takes a while to get into. Like all games in this series, I initially hate it, but the more I play, the more it grows on me. You'll definitely be doing a lot of slower speed races at first in order to earn money to buy better and faster cars. The graphics are really nice for the system at a rock solid 60 frames per second. However, the controls can take a while to get used to. The music is mostly excellent, so it gets bonus points from me. Want some sweet Killzone first-person shooter action? Well then don't play Killzone Liberation. That's right, this one is more of an overhead run and gun, which honestly I think is a nice change of pace. The structure and pacing of this one is similar to a standard first-person war game though. You have missions to accomplish, ammo to grab, and secondary weapons to use. And of course you have a radio buddy who magically knows exactly where you are and what you're doing at all times. Find some C4 to take down the wall. Rico should be in that area. You even get partners that roam around with you which you can give minor commands to. Of course, it doesn't take much for them to fall in battle which requires you to rejuvenate them. This annoying aspect kind of reminds me of the first Gears of War game. The game itself can be slightly cryptic. It took me a bit to figure that I need to toss a frag grenade right into these sensors to disable them. But let me tell you, aiming your grenade can be a little bit of a chore. The game is still pretty fun though. The graphics are good, but there's some screen tearing that pops up now and then. The sounds are average for this type of game. Unfortunately, there's no music during gameplay because, you know, it's super serious and all. Still, I'm glad that this wasn't just another first person shooter.
All right, like I said, the library is a lot like that of the PlayStation 2 with more serious games for older players. But is there any lighter stuff? You know, games with actual color in them? Hell yeah, there is. Mega Man Powered Up was released by Capcom in 2006. This is a remake of the first Mega Man game, only, you know, powered up. It's not a straightforward remake as the stages, while similar to the original, have all been reimagined and redesigned in many ways. The layout isn't the same. The game also gives you a break as there are now many checkpoints in each stage. But if you lose all of your lives and continue, you'll need to start back at the beginning of the stage. There's also an easy mode which can alter the stage slightly, like having these extra blocks to land on. The game even allows you to construct your own stages and you collect extra items as you play through the regular game. That's pretty cool. There are also brand new stages exclusive to this game to play through. There's an option to switch to old style from the menu in the beginning. This gives you the same exact stage layout and arrangement as the original game in a 4x3 aspect ratio, but with the new powered up polygon graphics. The controls are generally responsive, but it can also be a bit frustrating. It suffers from the same maladies that I feel infect the Genesis remakes. If you press a direction to run, Mega Man will hesitate before he starts moving. This makes dodging attacks a lot tougher than they need to be. You can really see this when you change a direction. See that? He's pausing before he begins moving. He feels, I don't know, sticky. I know that this occurs in the original games to some degree, but it feels much more exaggerated here, and that's honestly not a good thing. The control might be a bit more laggy than the original, but you'll get used to it after a few dozen deaths or so. I sure did. I've never been a huge fan of the Mega Man series. This is because I usually forget which order to play the stages in. Once you start unlocking weapons, items, and abilities, it becomes way more fun and honestly quite addictive. One change I really like is being able to switch weapons with the L and R buttons. You can even unlock boss characters to play as. I really like what they did with the graphics here and it's an excellent looking remake. It's one of the few PSP games that's not drowning in dithered graininess. The music is kind of a mixed bag, with some of the tunes suffering from a rather limp arrangement, while others like Bomb Man and Guts Man sound awesome. Not the Mega Man game I would choose for a remake, but they couldn't do the second Mega Man game because this one sold rather poorly. PSP owners hate Mega Man, I guess. If you like the first game, then you will absolutely love this, assuming the hesitating controls aren't an issue for you. I got used to them. Mega Man Maverick Hunter X was also released in 2006. That's right, the title screen says 2005. No need to leave a snide comment, I know about it. They probably just didn't bother to update the year for the North American release. It happens. This one was actually made and released before Mega Man powered up, but I played it after. This one is a straight up remake with none of the new additions that Mega Man powered up enjoyed. You have new graphics formatted for the PSP screen and redone music, but the same exact stage structure and mostly the same gameplay. Not that that's a bad thing if you enjoy Mega Man X. A lot of dialogue has been added. People who were kids when the original Mega Man games came out were teenagers once Mega Man X hit the stores, so they needed a little bit more angst in their game. Maverick Hunter X here delivers that in spades with super angry voice acting. Looks like you've gone Maverick. I'm taking you out. Overall, this is a good looking and sounding remake that controls well enough. Give it a try, but as for me, I'll stick with Mega Man Powered Up. Half Minute Hero from Marvelous Entertainment is definitely a unique take on RPGs. Basically, in each chapter, an evil lord casts a spell which will destroy the entire world for whatever reason in 30 seconds, and you have to stop them in that time. You have random battles that happen often to slow you down. It'll take you a few tries before you figure out each chapter in order to do everything fast enough. Often, you'll need to go to a town or a cave to get an item. Fortunately, the clock doesn't run when you're in areas like these. 
You'll also often have to pay to reset the clock, sometimes even more than once per chapter. Overall, it's a fun and lighthearted take on the genre, but it's definitely not for people who get stressed or anxious at these quickly running clocks. Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII is an action RPG. This takes place before the events of Final Fantasy VII proper. You play Zack, who is a soldier working for a soldier. You embark on many missions and come into contact with multiple characters from the real Final Fantasy VII. The story is pretty good and easy to follow. It kept me interested. Being as this is an action RPG, the battles are different from the original game. They're different from anything I've experienced in any other game, in fact. Basically, you lock onto an enemy and engage the action you've selected. At the bottom right of the screen are icons you cycle through with the L and R buttons. This all happens in real time, so if you need to take a potion or an elixir, you need to cycle into your bag and find it all while you run around. You can also select and use your magic attacks the same way. It sounds frustrating, but once you get used to it, it's actually really fun. And honestly, I was used to this by the second enemy I fought, so it doesn't take that long. There's also a slot machine type of deal in the upper left of the screen. These will automatically interrupt the battle to give you increased powers, level you up, or give you a super special attack. I didn't care for this aspect as I find slot machines and gambling pretty boring. I don't feel that this adds anything of substance to the game, but at least it's automatic as far as I can tell and you don't seem to have to worry much about it. I could have paid more attention or at least some attention to the tutorials if I wanted to figure it out, but nah. This game really dates itself with the flip phones that are everywhere. Not only that, but everyone loves to send email back and forth as a prime means of communication. You'll be reading a lot of emails. Wandering around a few of the areas can get a touch boring because they seem so empty. Mostly though, I found this game to be extremely entertaining with some good characters. Towards the end of the game, you might also be persuaded to feel some emotions. The visuals are all very well done featuring some cool enemy designs. The music is also extremely good, though it's not from the original composer. I ended up liking this one a lot more than I thought I would, and I definitely recommend giving it a go. Activating combat mode. Yeah. Now, I certainly can't cover every single PSP game, and I'll probably miss your favorite simply because I'm not you. But there are a few more that I want to mention because it's my show and I really want to talk about them, so let's go. Of course, I need to mention the Ease titles that are on the PSP, like Ease 1 and 2 Chronicles. This action RPG is a remake of the first two games. Or maybe a remake of a remake, as it's based on Ease 1 and 2 Complete, which is based on Ease Book 1 and 2. Got all that? Good. Anyway, I really like this one. You can select either game right from the start. There are small bits and pieces that have been added over the original game, and most places are significantly bigger. It still has the bump combat, though, so some people are still going to complain. But I really love the redone 2D artwork. You can also choose from three different styles of the music. I really like both Complete and the new Chronicles music. I switch back and forth a lot just so I can hear how they both sound. The only thing I don't like about this disc is that the scrolling is only 30 frames per second, so it's a bit choppy. This game is also one of the more expensive PSP titles these days. Ease Othenfelgana is a remake of Ease 3. This one is rebuilt from scratch and now takes place in a 3D-ish world like the more modern Ease games. The story is the same, but everything has been greatly expanded here. Even the music has been redone and it's incredible. Some of the areas don't work very well in 3D thanks to being able to fall all the way down to the bottom countless times. Very annoying. I still prefer the original game as flawed as it is, but this one is still fun to play if you're a fan.
Ease Ark of Napishtim is actually Ease 6. This was not only the first Ease game to be released on the PSP, but also the first Ease game to take place with these kinds of 3D polygons. It's pretty rough around the edges all over, but the gameplay is generally pretty good. This is far from the best version of the game, but it's still worth a try if you want a portable version. Lastly, there's E7, which is only on the PSP and Steam. This is also the game that prompted me to finally buy a PSP. This one is really well done, though it starts a tad slow. This is the first game in the series that's based around partner switching, where you travel with up to three people and they each have a certain type of monster they're best at defeating. For example, using Dogi as your main character will help you defeat rock monsters faster. It's also the first game where you collect parts from enemies you defeated to make better items. Overall, the game is very much worth playing with good graphics and excellent music just like you'd expect. This is definitely the best Ease game on the PSP, but I'm still hoping for a console port someday. There are a few Grand Theft Auto games on the system, but the one I want to talk about is Grand Theft Auto Liberty City Stories. That's because this is the best-selling game on the platform. It kind of shows you that the audience that bought the PSP generally skews a little higher in age than other portable systems like the DS. This takes place before Grand Theft Auto 3 and also in the same city. It also plays just like you'd expect. You can do missions which will result in you needing to drive from place to place to take care of business. This earns you money and sometimes other things. Or you can just waste your time causing havoc in the streets. It's all up to you, and that's what I love about this series. It is kind of scaled back compared to Grand Theft Auto 3, but that's to be expected. The graphics are good for the system considering the overall size of the game. And of course, the radio stations while driving around can be hilarious. The internet may appear new and fun, but it's really a porn highway to hell. If your children want to get on the internet, don't let them. It's only a matter of time before they get sucked into a vortex of shame, drugs, and pornography from which they'll never recover. This game was also ported to the PS2 and mobile phones. Overall, it's definitely a fun little GTA. My fries are on the seat! I got I don't know, Cliff. Sometimes guys can sing great too. Oh, stop creeping me out. You're a teenager, so you're really important. We understand that. Now, it's time for you. In 2006, Capcom released Ultimate Ghosts and Goblins. Once again, the princess has been kidnapped, and of course, you need to rescue her. If you've played other games in this series, then the basics are very familiar. You jump around and you get an assortment of different weapons. You can shoot in all four directions like Ghouls and Ghosts, and you can even double jump like in Super Ghouls and Ghosts. Well, once you get the winged boot, that is, but that happens at the end of the first level. Like any game in the series, it's definitely challenging, but this one gives you more hits before you die, more lives to start out with, and it even responds you where you die. This is all on the normal difficulty setting. This game knows how tough it is. There's also lots of stuff to collect if you want the proper ending, and you can revisit the stages you've cleared to make sure you get everything. The graphics are really good, but I feel that the control is kind of weird since it's all polygons now. You get used to it, but it's just not the same or even as good as it is with sprites. The music, on the other hand, is generally pretty good throughout. This is indeed the ultimate Ghosts and Goblins game, but that's to be expected since there's only two of these. It doesn't hold a candle to either of the Ghouls and Ghosts games, however. Yep, that's a technicality based on the North American names, and yes, I will die on this hill. Hammer and Hero from IREM was released in 2009. You may be familiar with the series as Hammer and Harry on the Game Boy or the Famicom. Well, here you play as Gen and not Harry. 
You have a hammer and you go to town trying to prevent an evil dude's sublime plan. You have a vertical attack with a square button and a slightly slower horizontal attack with a triangle button. Along the way, you'll encounter people, animals, and things that are in some form of distress. This is indicated by the sad balloon that's near them. Smash it to help them out and they'll often help you in some way. You've got to be careful in this one as you die in a single hit and you get sent back. You can smash a bubble to get a helmet which allows you to take an extra hit though. Between stages, you can read thank you letters from all the people you've helped out. You can also switch jobs if you have any available. Doing this changes your clothes and also your method of attack in the action stages. The graphics are great and very colorful, and I'd also describe the music as colorful as well. The game is really fun, but it can be frustrating since it's so easy to die. Still, I definitely recommend checking this one out. And there's the PSP for you. I know I didn't talk about Castlevania The Dracula X Chronicles, which is a really good game for the system, but I want to do an in-depth review on that in the next Castlevania episode I do down the road. And a lot of PSP games, I've got to say, they did not feel like cut down portable versions, and that totally blew me away back in the day. As for the system itself, the analog nub thing kind of does take a while to get used to. It's certainly not optimal, and some games do suffer from the lack of a dual analog, but come on the PSP. For what this thing is, it's absolutely insanely awesome. What do you think of the PSP? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. You know, I went that entire episode without once saying that the PlayStation Portable, or PSP if you will, is backwards compatible with the original PlayStation's library. And I want to play the best PlayStation game on it right now. And that, of course, is Kalik, the DNA Imperative. anyway. Hello and welcome to GameSack. As you can tell by the shirt I'm wearing, this episode is all about the PlayStation Vita. Now this is a system that was never really given much of a chance by Sony themselves. It almost seemed like they completely ignored it not long after it was launched. Anyway, let's take a closer look at the system itself. The Sony PlayStation Vita. Sony's second entry into the portable game market was released in late December of 2011 and in 2012 everywhere else. Featuring a gorgeous 5-inch OLED touchscreen, dual analog sticks, a rear touchpad, and dual cameras, the Vita was and still is an impressive piece of portable gaming technology. Instead of the disc media used in its predecessor, the Vita uses solid-state cards to store the games. The system also requires a proprietary memory card to store game save data and whatnot. One of these cards originally did not come packed in with the Vita. The controls on the unit generally feel pretty good, though the face buttons feel a bit small and my thumb often hits the right thumbstick when I press them. The Vita is backwards compatible with the PSP in the same way that the Nintendo Switch is backwards compatible with all of your NES cartridges. Digital only. You can play between 5 and 6 hours before the battery runs out. A slim model of the Vita was released in 2014 that replaces the OLED screen with a regular LCD one and offers an extra hour of battery life. The Vita is powered by a quad-core ARM Cortex-A9 and a quad-core PowerVR SGX 543MP4 Plus for the graphics with 512 and 128 megabytes of RAM, respectively. The graphics resolution maxes out at 960 by 544 about one-quarter of full 1080p HD. 
The separately released PlayStation TV allows you to play Vita games on your TV via HDMI using a PS3 or PS4 controller. But many games are not officially supported due to their Vita-specific features like the touchscreen, touchpad, cameras, and gyroscope. A big hit at first, Vita sales quickly died down and Sony seemed to lose interest in supporting the system. It's estimated that anywhere between 10 and 15 million units have been sold with about 1,500 games released. In my opinion, that proprietary memory card was one of the worst ideas Sony has ever had, especially not including it with the system. They're always trying to come up with new formats and it backfires on them more often than not. Anyway, enough of that. Let's look at some of the games for the system. You can't have an episode about the Vita without mentioning Gravity Rush. Well, maybe you can, but not on GameSack. At the time of its release in mid-2012, it was one of the killer apps for the portable system. You play as Cat, who has amnesia. You soon find out that you have the ability to shift gravity, and as you've probably guessed, that's the main play mechanic in this game. You disengage from normal gravity by pressing the R button. You hover as you orient the camera to the place that you'd like to float to, and then press R again. You can't do this indefinitely, though, as you have a bar in the upper left of the screen which will run out. If you press the L button, you'll return to normal gravity and your meter will quickly recharge. The amount of non-gravity the bar can hold as well as other abilities can be powered up throughout the game. There's also combat, which for the most part is pretty simple and fun. Just attack enemies in their weak spot by kicking them with the square button. Some enemies are floating in the air, so you may need to target them and then fly towards them with an air kick. Bigger enemies on the ground may also need to be attacked in this way. The game uses the touchscreen a lot, mainly to advance conversations. You also need the swipe to screen to advance the comic book-like pages of the story. What's really bad though is that the game wants you to swipe the screen to evade attacks during combat. Uh, no thank you. I'll just move out of the way with the analog stick if you don't mind. The cell shaded graphics look really nice, though they do run at a lower resolution than normal for the system. I like how stylish some things are, and whenever something has color, it really stands out among the dusty looking surroundings. That's good because usually it's something of significance. The music is mostly fantastic with a lot of it coming from a real orchestra. This is an excellent game. However, I personally would prefer the remaster on the PlayStation 4 for the sharper graphics and omissions of any of the touchscreen shenanigans. I haven't played that version yet, so hopefully they didn't break it. But if you want to play it on the go, then it works great on the Vita. Want some sweet Killzone first-person shooter action? Then be sure to check out Killzone Mercenary, released in 2013. Unlike the PSP, the Vita has two analog sticks, so a first-person shooter can actually work pretty well here. Obviously, I'm playing on the PlayStation TV to capture this footage, and the game even recognizes that I'm using a PS3 controller in the options. This is a nice high-budget game that a lot of work clearly went into. It plays like your standard first-person shooter game, with similar controls and missions that involve you moving from one area to another, having shootouts along the way. There's nothing tremendously new here when it comes to the action, though I did find the melee attacks pretty fun. They require you to throw the analog sticks in certain directions, and once you do it a few times it feels like second nature. Overall, I have no issues with the control, and the game itself is good, though I'm not the biggest fan of first-person shooters. It didn't give me any motion sickness like these types of games usually do, and the mission structure kept me interested. Of course, there are random weapon shops scattered throughout just like there are in any combat zone. The visuals are outstanding, especially for a portable system. I mean, look, they're nearly PlayStation 3 quality. Sometimes the frame rate will take a hit though. Still, if you want a portable first-person shooter on a system initially released in 2011, this game absolutely delivers.
Ridge Racer was released in 2011 and is often referred to as Ridge Racer Vita. I was really looking forward to playing this one because Ridge Racer is usually awesome, especially on Sony systems. Sadly, that's not the case here and the game is mostly a letdown. This one tries to envelop you in a more social world, making you pick a sponsor at the start, and then you're literally locked in that same group with other people who also chose that same sponsor. That's right, it wants you to do most of your racing online. The control and racing mechanics are actually pretty good, and it's fun to drive your car around the track. But sadly, this game has a really bad single player mode. It's completely boring. All you can do is race a ghost, do a spot race, which is considered training or a time attack. There's also lots and lots of menus that are touch screen only. The graphics and music are both average, but there are a couple of standout tunes here and there. Sadly, the visuals only update at 30 frames per second, which is half as fast as the PSP versions. I can't really recommend this one. Like I said, I was immensely disappointed because Ridge Racer games are usually pretty darn good. Just two laps to go. Air Race Speed from Cubic is a slightly more interesting racing game. Here you're basically just racing against the clock through a series of tubes just for fun. There are no other racers besides you, and you need to do your best not to run into obstacles. The game reminds me of Atari's Stun Runner combined with Crystal Dynamics Total Eclipse just without the shooting action. It's fun to race through the tubes as the game moves fast and you really need to be quick on the controls. Unfortunately, one time when I died, the game froze on me, so it still has some bugs. I still recommend that you try this one though. Even with its little quirks, it's quite fun. This next game I'm going to talk about, once I get off the screen, was only available at GameStop, at least initially. I asked the old, let's limit the number of places our customers can buy the game tactic. Everyone loves that, it always works out great. Anyway, it's a nice game though. This is Tales of Hearts R from Namco, which was released in 2014. The original Tales of Hearts was a DS game, and this remake has been rebuilt from the ground up. Like all of the games in the Tales series, it's an RPG with a few elements from other games sprinkled in here and there. You play as an angsty teen trying to find shards of emotions that were broken away from a mysterious teenage girl. That's about as basic as I can summarize the story. The characters are all very stereotypical of a lot of JRPGs, with extremely impatient male characters who freak out over every little thing and everyone has their emotions dialed up to 11. You have towns with lots of people to talk to and things to do. The combat is mostly real time with you controlling the main character. Eventually, others will join you in battle to help out. Everyone who participates in battle gets experience and levels up. They can also be equipped with better items and so on. But not everyone that travels with you will fight. Sometimes, you'll have to go into a person's soul to extract an emotion shard. Of course, there's monsters and boss characters roaming around in there too. The combat is pretty fun, though I think I would like it more if I had never played any of the games from the E series. Still, it works fine and the game gives you a break if you need to use an item. However, if you do use one, you need to wait a bit before you can use another item. The visuals are roughly PlayStation 2 quality and honestly that's just fine. There's lots of anime cutscenes which is one of the main additions over the original DS version. There's also a lot of voice acting, though it's all in Japanese. The music from Matoi Sakuraba is adequate yet forgettable. I've always felt that maybe he got burnt out from being so prolific in the 2000s. I do really like this game though, and I like that it's not puzzle based like Tales of Symphonia was. This is a comfortable and enjoyable RPG that doesn't try to reinvent the wheel.
Dead or Alive 5 Plus was released in 2013. This is a slight upgrade to the original Dead or Alive 5, which was on the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. It's pretty much standard Dead or Alive action, which is good. There are a few characters from Virtua Fighter to fight and also play as. The story mode is pretty easy and sometimes it feels like you're spending more time watching FMV than you are fighting. The arcade mode can unlock a few minor things like extra costumes. The stages are mostly extremely cool, many with lots of chaos going on everywhere. And you can move into different areas of the stage throughout the battle just like you can in previous Dead or Alive games. Well, except the first one. A few stages are uninteresting, like the circus stages. Things added for this particular version are more training options as well as a silly touch play mode. I'm not even going to bother with that. The graphics are all great and move around at 60 frames per second with very few hiccups. The music is fine for the game, but nothing that I would consider especially memorable. If you want Dead or Alive on the go, then this certainly won't disappoint. Of course, I've got to mention Hot Shots Golf World Invitational. Like all of the other games in the series, this one is a joy to play and a great way to pass the time. You can choose stroke play just to have fun, or you can choose challenges where you earn points. You then use these points in the shop to buy stuff and unlock features. As always, the gameplay is quite easy to get into, even if you don't like golf or haven't played a golf video game before. The graphics are pleasant, though they run at a significantly lower resolution than most Vita games for some reason. The music is really nice and somehow never gets annoying. I'll always recommend Hot Shots Golf on any Sony platform, and this one is no exception. Three, two. Here's Wipeout 2048, which is exclusive to the Vita. It's basically kind of a retooled version of Wipeout HD on the PS3. Don't let that fool you though, as this is a really good game. Supposedly, it also helped shape the Vita itself as it was designed along with the hardware and was a launch game in multiple regions. As a game, it's quite good and you have a map that you move around by touching it, which grows and grows with more events as you play. The events vary from races to time attacks or even just trying to stay alive as long as possible. Always make sure to pay attention to the criteria required. Yes, the vehicular combat is still here and some events even concentrate on it, having you score enough points by damaging enemies in order to earn a clear. The controls are smooth and I've never had any issues with this game whatsoever. It feels a bit easy, but trust me it can get pretty intense later on. The graphics were meant to be a showcase for the system when it launched and it definitely succeeded at that. I mean, let's be real here, these are way better than anything the 3DS could dream of doing. They also do a great job of capturing what the year 2048 will actually look like, which is only 28 years away from when I'm making this episode. Unfortunately, it only runs at 30 frames per second, which is weird for a Wipeout game, which usually run at 60 frames. But it doesn't impact the gameplay and it also doesn't make me motion sick. The music is all electronic and mostly good, especially if you like some dubstep in your games. If you like your racing game set in the near future, you can't go wrong here. This crazy game is Mobile Suit Gundam Extreme vs. Force, which is a Vita exclusive. First off, this is a pretty great mech game. It kinda sorta reminds me of Gun Griffin on the Saturn, but with faster paced action and the ability to have assistant mechs. That's right, you can pick various mechs or Gundams to help you out on your mission. 
and your mission can be one of several things. Defeat all of the enemies, defeat a boss, or even capture all of the bases on a map. All of the Gundams that you choose of course cost money, and you get more of that as well as level up each unit as you complete missions. The action is pretty good. You can lock onto enemies and shoot them from afar or even melee them up close. It's really quite fun and blowing up other mechs is immensely satisfying. There are tons upon tons of Japanese voices in here. And if that's not enough, there are usually multiple people talking at once. Everyone has a lot to say and you need to hear it all. Well actually you don't, but the game sure seems to think that you do. This might be a good thing though, as otherwise the repetitive music might be too noticeable. This game was released in the US, but it's extremely hard to come by. To my knowledge, the Asian version is the same and much cheaper. Check the comments though to see if anyone corrects me on this, as info on the different versions is pretty hard to come by. Still though, if you can, try this one out, it's super fun. <laughs> TXK from Llamasoft is a Tempest ripoff. And that said, it's a really good Tempest clone. Basically, you just need to navigate around the wireframe structure, zapping wireframe bad guys as they come at you. You control your little thing by pressing left or right, and I found it easier to use the D-pad as opposed to the analog stick. You get a super zapper which kills everything on screen that you can use once per stage, but here it's called the super tapper. Ah, that's a pretty clever way to be completely original. You can even earn a jump, and this can come in handy if the bad guys make it to the edge where you're moving back and forth. I love the vector-like visuals, and it's full of amazing color. The music is energetic, but maybe not quite as good as Tempest 2000's music. I wish I could remember Tempest 3000's music. I played it once on the new one, but like an idiot, I didn't record it. Anyway, this is a fun game to play for a few minutes every once in a while. If you've watched GameSack for any length of time, then you know I've got to mention all the games in the E-Series that showed up on the Vita. I sure did like making these things for Sony's portable system. Not that I'm complaining. Ease, Memories of Celseta was the game that made me finally buy a Vita nearly 11 months after it was launched. This is a remake of East 4 from Falcom themselves. Previously, Falcom had farmed out East 4 to other developers for whatever reason, and now this is the one that officially counts. It's mostly all new, and it's not a remake of either Dawn of East for the PC Engine CD, nor Mask of the Sun for the Super Famicom. However, it does feature a lot of the same characters, and the story takes a few nods from the previous games. For a while, this one was exclusive to the Vita before finding its way to the PC, and most recently, the PlayStation 4. You've lost your memories, and you slowly gather them back through glowing orbs as you set out to map the forest of Celseta. The game's action is exactly like E7 with its three-party system, but now you have a super attack once you gain enough energy to do it. As always, the action is incredibly fun and the game is engrossing. However, sometimes you're allowed to make choices in the game, and the prompts come up so quickly that I accidentally just select whatever is the default one since I'm cycling through the rest of the text as fast as I can read it. It doesn't matter much anyway, and the choices are really out of character and represent the translator's personality more than anything. Also, the game's going to proceed the exact same way no matter what you choose. You're also forced to cycle through what could have been a printed instruction manual which bogs down the gameplay in the beginning. However, I'll take this over a forced tutorial any day. The graphics are pretty nice, but the frame rate can be pretty bad, especially in the cutscenes. The music is naturally outstanding, much of it from the previous East games, but rearranged here. There's some new stuff as well, and it doesn't disappoint. While this game certainly isn't as good as Dawn of East on the PC Engine, it's still fantastic in its own right and should not be missed.
East 8, Lacrimosa of Donna is probably my favorite game in the series. I bought the Vita version mainly to support the series so that they keep translating them and bringing them over. I initially played through it on the PlayStation 4, but this version is pretty good as well, though it runs at half the frame rate. You begin your adventure on a nice, peaceful cruise talking to people. But that comes to an abrupt stop when you're attacked by a giant sea monster. Later, you along with everyone else wake up on a mysterious island. The gameplay is exactly like Memories of Celsetta, which is a good thing. Oh, and you can jump now, so that's even better. Like Killzone, this one takes advantage of the PlayStation 3 controller if you play it on a PlayStation TV. Oh, and check out the back of the box here. Now, I don't read or speak French, but something is definitely up with this text here. This was discovered by the fantastic site DigitalEmilist.com, which is dedicated to all things ease. According to them, this is placeholder text, and it's saying something to the effect of, I'm sorry to leave you, but I have to buy a hat. I am going to ask these peasants who come to meet us if the way in which they have passed is bad. NIS America eventually fixed this and re-released it with a correct French text. This was the first version made, and the PlayStation 4 version has a bit more content, but I haven't played far enough in this one to see what's missing. Of course, the graphics aren't quite as good as the PlayStation 4 version, but it's perfectly playable. You'll also get to enjoy a ton of outstanding music, which of course is no big surprise. East Origin came to the Vita in 2017, 11 years after it was initially released on PC. As a result, this game does show its age, but it's still an absolute blast to play through. This is the only game in the series thus far that doesn't feature Adol as the main character. It takes place about 800 years prior to his adventures. You can select to play as one of two different characters. The entire game takes place inside Darm Tower, which is about 100 times bigger than it was in East 1, maybe even more. Regardless, the graphics are decent, though sadly run at half the frame rate of pretty much any other version. And as always, the music is incredible. This is a fun one for sure. Uncharted Golden Abyss has been mentioned on the show before, but it simply must be mentioned in this episode, even if it's brief. After all, it's one of the few true exclusive games on the Vita, and as of the making of this episode, hasn't been ported to any other platform. It wasn't developed by Naughty Dog, but instead Bend Studio, who has mostly been responsible for the Siphon Filter games. This was a launch game and probably helped sell a few Vitas. Wow, both this and Wipeout? That's actually not a bad launch lineup. It's expressly designed to use all of the gimmicky features on the system, which is the game's greatest flaw in my opinion. During melee attacks, for instance, you need to swipe in the direction of the arrows to finish off your opponent. This one takes place before the first game on the PlayStation 3. You're still exploring ancient runes and climbing all over the place just like in the other games, but now you have to worry about touch features, which is neat the first few times it happens, but it gets old quickly. Regardless of all that, this is a solid adventure with a nice presentation. If you enjoy the other Uncharted games, I say take a chance on this one. If you hate touchscreen and motion controls, well then stay far, far away. They're worth it for this game though. Now, if you want a game that uses every single gimmick possible, then Tear Away from the makers of Little Big Planet is a good one to have. This is the only way I can record this game as it crashes on a PlayStation TV, even if it's been hacked. But then again, the PlayStation TV doesn't have a camera and you kind of need that here. Look, there they are. Ooh. What is it? You basically play as a piece of mail in a land built of paper. You'll need to engage the rear touchpad for things like these bouncing drums. You'll also be touching the screen for a lot of basic attacks. Even the gyroscope is in use here. This is by no means a bad game, even with all of these gimmicks. 
It's one of the few games on the planet that actually makes good use of the gimmicks like this. However, I'm just not set up to capture the gameplay this way and having all of this equipment in front of me as I play started to get uncomfortable really fast. Still, you definitely want to give Tearaway a try. Lost Dimension from Atlas is an interesting take on strategy RPGs. Basically, half of the world has been destroyed by some guy for no discernible reason. It doesn't waste your time trying to set up the entire story at the beginning of the game, but instead tells you as you progress. You control a band of gifted warriors, each with their own special power that they can use in battle. The game works similar to other strategy RPGs in that you have a limited amount of space that you can move and you can only attack enemies in range. Gone are the grids and hexagons though, I really like how it's set up here. You can choose a main attack or gift, which is your character's special ability if they have one. Of course, there is a player phase and an enemy phase. Between missions, you can talk to all of the characters and hopefully build some camaraderie. You can also get new items and set up your characters and all that. When a mission is over is also when you gain all of your experience and level up. If there's one thing that I don't particularly care for, it's the loading time before attacks that often occurs during battle. Other than that, it's all good and there are lots of missions to take on. The visuals are decent if a bit low budget, but the music is pretty good. Definitely check this out if you like strategy RPGs. It's also on the PlayStation 3 and Windows. Ever since Phoenix Wright on the DS, I've loved visual novels, at least the ones with interaction and actual gameplay in them. Now, I don't know what ever made me look up information on the Danganronpa series to see if I'd like it, but I'm sure glad I did. Danganronpa Trigger Happy Havoc was a really nice surprise when it was released in 2013. Originally a PSP game in Japan, I first played it here on the Vita. I love these types of games because it reminds me a lot of how Phoenix Wright plays. You're a kid who's been accepted to a school for extremely gifted people. Right as you walk in, you seem to faint. You wake up and find that you're locked inside the school with 14 other students, and even the windows have metal plates installed on them. What is going on here? You're called to the gym by the headmaster who turns out to be an evil teddy bear. I'm not a teddy bear. His name is Monokuma, and he says the only way anyone can leave the school is if they kill someone. It doesn't matter who or how, but if they can remain undiscovered as the murderer, they'll be allowed to leave. Of course, this makes everyone freak out and not trust each other at all. The gameplay largely consists of lots of conversations. You can wander around at your leisure as well as investigate different items throughout each room. Eventually, you'll go to trial to find out who killed who. These can be a bit convoluted, but they work. Your goal in the game isn't to kill someone else, it's to find out who the killer is. Like I said, if the killer goes undiscovered, they get to leave the school, but then everyone else dies, so it's kind of in everyone's best interest to find out who the murderer is. Well, everyone's best interest except the actual killer. There are tons upon tons of mostly automated conversations in this game, but for whatever reason, I enjoy it anyway because they do a good job of keeping you interested. The only thing that slightly bothers me about this is that sometimes the voice will say something different than the actual text. Come on. You hear me? Seriously, why even have the voice play at all in these situations? Oh, there is one other thing that bothers me about this game, and that's that all the blood is pink, despite the game being rated M. I get that this is probably a stylistic choice for whatever reason, but I still think it looks kind of dumb. Other than those two things, I have zero complaints. I love how everything is in 2D and drops into a room as you enter. I love the illustrations. The music is also extremely good. What? Stop talking. I highly recommend this one and it kept me engrossed throughout. 
There are two sequels on the Vita which feature new characters and scenarios. They both have similar gameplay with new stuff added to enjoy as well. A side story to these games is Danganronpa Ultra Despair Girls. This one isn't an investigative adventure, but rather a third-person shooter which features some characters from the first two games. You're hunting down Monokumas who are absolutely everywhere, killing people. Your weapon has different types of bullets that you can fire. For example, a green move bullet can activate locks, cars, and other things so that you can progress. You acquire more kinds of bullets as you move through the game. You can also switch to Genocide Jill who can slice up enemies and moves really fast and has bad camera control. Mostly this game is pretty good, but it does interrupt the gameplay for tons of chit chat, especially towards the beginning. This is fine in the regular games, but it gets kind of annoying in an action game. Otherwise, this is a fairly decent side story. You can also get all of the Danganronpa games on the PlayStation 4. Not as I thought, Master's Gun is perfect. Even idiots can use it. That kid was playing with a body. It's not a rare sight around here. Ouch! Super Monkey Ball Banana Splits was the last original Monkey Ball game ever released, at least at the time of this episode. Is it the game that killed the franchise? Perhaps. The game gives you a choice between normal controls or tilting controls where, of course, you tilt your Vita. The game also relies on the touch screen for all menu selections. Why normal controls can't also be used for the menu functions is beyond me. Just goes to show how out of touch Sega is, I guess. The premise is simply to get your monkey to the goal. Collecting bananas on the way will eventually earn you a one-up. The small Vita analog stick mostly suffices for this game. You think it might be a little easier using a PlayStation TV and a real PlayStation controller, but it actually isn't. If you play it that way, you'll also need to worry about accidentally pushing in an analog stick which engages the touchscreen controls and your monkey loses control. Also, I've probably said this before, but I'm gonna say it again. There is no analog stick on the planet that can match what the GameCube has. As a result, controlling this game is noticeably more wonky than the originals. The stages take a few nods from the past games, but mostly it's all original. The beginner and normal modes can be cleared pretty easily, but the advanced mode will start to ruin your life right away. Rolling across this dinosaur is outright brutal. It doesn't look it, but it is, and you'll need more luck than skill to do it. There are a bunch of party games on here, even Monkey Target, which is my favorite, but you need to use the motion controls to play it and most of the other party games. The good news is that the graphics are pretty nice and seem to take inspiration from the absolutely horrible Wii entries in the series. But they also soon start to flourish on their own after you get past a few stages. It's also one of only a handful of Vita games that run at 60 frames per second. The music is great as well. Overall, this isn't a horrible game, but it could definitely be better. I'd say that this is probably the fourth best Monkey Ball game behind the first and then the second game and then the 3DS entry. Ready? Go! Here's an interesting one called Soul Sacrifice, which is exclusive to the Vita. This one was designed by Kaiji Inafuni of Capcom fame. Well, after he left Capcom, of course. This game is full of cool ideas. You're a dude in some sort of prison who stumbles across a book. Well, actually, you don't have to be a dude. You can design your own character. Anyway, within the book's pages are the journals of the final boss who has you imprisoned and also whom you must eventually defeat. You relive what he wrote in it, and that comprises the action stages. You have a bunch of functions that you can assign to the various buttons and you can switch between them with the R button. Once you defeat a monster, it turns into kind of a black blob. You then determine if you will save or sacrifice it. 
Saving it will get you some life back, whereas sacrificing it will restore some of your attacks as most aren't unlimited. You're usually on the battleground with another character, and if you die, you can have them save or sacrifice you. Most of the attacks are very, very slow and happen quite some time after you press the button since you need to wait for lots of animation. I feel the fighting mechanics could be better, as the enemy will often move out of the way before you're able to get some of those attacks off. You'll be rewarded depending on how you do in battle, and before each phantom quest, you'll be able to choose which kinds of powers you'd like to take with you. You can also power them up and replenish them on this screen. Despite the laggy controls, this is still a fun and interesting game to play. The bosses are all extremely tough and require a bit of work to finish off. The visuals are perfect for the game. Some of the stronger attacks you can do look pretty crazy. The music by Yasunori Matsuda and Wataru Hokoyama is a mix between beautiful and outright bombastic. I think everyone should try this one to see if they like it. For the most part, I certainly did. There's also Soul Sacrifice Delta, which is a slightly upgraded version. There you go, a bunch of games for the Vita that I felt like talking about for one reason or another. It's an interesting system for sure, and I wonder what kinds of games would have come out for it had Sony given it more love. Believe it or not, there are still games being released for the thing from time to time from third parties. It's a cool system, but I gotta say, I like the PSP more. In fact, I like it a lot more. But what do you think of the Vita? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSec. You know, I just realized I didn't cover any of the 2D fighting games that are on the Vita. So let's take a look at Dengeki Bunko Fighting Climax. It even says Sega on the back. Wait! Don't play that game! What? Why not? Who are you? I'm you from the future. Ten minutes in the future to be exact. I built a time machine to come back to warn you not to play that game! Why, is this a bad game? I mean, it's okay, I guess, but... Look what happens to you if you play it! Oh, you're from the future, huh? Well, then who's Secretary of State? In the future. I'm only from 10 minutes in the future, so the same one, obviously. Do you have flying cars? Yeah, of course. I'm from the future, duh. Hmm... Screw this, I'm gonna play! No! Worth it. Hello and welcome to GameSack. Today I'm taking a look at the Virtual Boy and every single game that was released for it and a few that weren't. Okay, I can't do these scenes this way. Hold on. <laughs> All right, these on-camera segments can be a slight reprieve for your eyeballs between the game segments. And before we talk about those games, let's take a closer look at what the Virtual Boy actually is. The Nintendo Virtual Boy. After the wild success of the Game Boy, creator Gunpai Yokoi led the department that would create the Virtual Boy, a standalone headset that utilizes two monochrome LED screens with parallax effects to simulate a 3D effect. The red color was chosen because it was cheaper and it uses less battery power. With the technology of the time, Ikoi states that users did not see depth with the full color LCD screens that they tried. The Virtual Boy ultimately suffered during development as the Nintendo 64 was being planned at the same time, so internal resources were limited. The Virtual Boy controller is interesting as it has two D-pads, one on each side. 
It also has your standard B and A buttons, start and select, and L and R buttons that rest under your index fingers. The controller also contains the power supply for the system. Either a pack of batteries can be used, which lasts about four hours, or a Super Nintendo AC adapter. Believe it or not, the Virtual Boy is a 32-bit system using the same CPU found in NEC's ill-fated PCFX console, the V810 running at 20 MHz. It also has 1 MB of DRAM and 512K of PSRAM cache. The Virtual Boy runs at 50.7 frames per second with 32 levels of redness intensity and 6 channels of stereo sound. The system is known for giving players headaches, so each game has an auto-pause feature which pauses gameplay after 30 minutes to give you a chance to rest. This can be disabled whenever you power up your game. For this episode, I'm using a cool, consoleized Virtual Boy to record the game, so the gameplay you see here is being run on original hardware. The Virtual Boy was a huge failure, selling less than 800,000 units with only 22 games being released worldwide. Why Nintendo didn't see this system as a bad idea during the concept stages is beyond me. But it did make it to the market with a whopping 14 games released in North America and 19 released in Japan. And like I said, we're going to take a look at each of them, though not necessarily in the order in which they were released, but it doesn't really matter because they were all pretty much released in 1995. Anyway, let's get to the games. Mario's Tennis was the pack-in game for the Virtual Boy in 1995. You wouldn't think it would be wise to pack in a sports game, but as you probably know, the Mario line of sports games are all pretty darn good. The thing is, though, is that this is a straight-up tennis game and it doesn't have any of the fancy power-ups or items that the later games would have. Still, it's pretty fun. You can pick from one of eight characters for a single match or tournament play. Each opponent has their own background, but the courts themselves are always the same. This one really relies on the 3D effect to judge the position of the ball. It's really hard to play in 2D since the ball doesn't have a shadow on the ground to tell you where it is. The 3D effect is really good though and I love how the court moves around. I do feel that the control could be a bit better as it does feel a bit stiff, but for its time it was fine. The music is good and the game is fun and it's interesting to see where Mario Tennis held the entire Mario sports franchise began. Red Alarm from t &E Soft attempts to put the virtual in Virtual Boy. This is a shooter where the visuals are completely wireframe. You fly around and destroy things, making your way through the stage. Eventually, you'll be able to fight a boss. It reminds me of a primitive version of Star Fox. The controls take a bit to get used to, but once you do, there's a lot to like here. Button A speeds you up, while button B slows you down and can even make you go in reverse. The left D-pad will steer your ship left, right, up, and down. But you'll also need to use the right D-pad as it gives you a quick burst of speed enabling you to strafe horizontally and vertically. You fire your guns with the R button. Like I said, it takes a bit to get used to. You only have one life, but you can continue from the last stage you made it to if you die. It's really fun shooting down the enemies and flying through the wireframe corridors. Perhaps the best part of the game, though, is that it's constantly telling you T&E Soft presents Red Alarm Nintendo Virtual Boy. It literally never stops writing that on the screen. You know, in case you accidentally think you're playing the Vectrex or something. I like wireframe graphics like this for some reason. Like flat-shaded polygons, it's an aesthetic that I never get tired of no matter how primitive it looks. So it goes without saying that I enjoy the visuals even if they can be a bit confusing at times. The music is pretty nice as well. This is a game that will keep you coming back at least a few times, and I recommend it. Here's Gulf from T&E Soft. 
Golf is what T and Esoft usually makes, but this is subpar even for them. If you've played any other golf game, this is set up in a similar fashion. It's certainly no Hot Shots Golf, but eventually it'll get used to its timing and how everything works. The 3D effect isn't bad as it uses polygons to fill in the course, but the dithering used to shade the game can mess with your eyes a bit in 3D. At first, it's really hard to get any accuracy in your shots. The repetitive music doesn't help things at all either. Plus, there's no Craig Stadler anywhere. This is an average golf game at best. Up next is Mario Clash. So a blimp comes in and puts its flag on top of an extremely tall tower. I mean, look how tall this thing is. For whatever reason, Mario is having absolutely none of that. So he enters the tower and he must clear it floor by floor. This plays kind of like an updated version of the original Mario Brothers. At least that's what it reminds me of. You need to clear the level of all the turtles. Yeah, I know they're not called turtles. I just said that to trigger you. You can't jump on the armored ones because if you do, you die. So you need to capture the innocent ones without armor and then toss them into the other enemies. Some enemies can't be attacked head on, so you need to hit them with a shell thrown from across the screen. There's a slight puzzle aspect to it all. The level layouts get more and more complex, making it harder to attack the enemy. I like the concept here, but it personally didn't hold my interest for very long. I still think that you should give it a try though. Okay, okay, these Virtual Boy games do take a little bit of getting used to, but we're gonna get through this, you and me, together. Let's continue with Galactic Pinball. Welcome to Space World, let's go. It's time for some 3D pinball action with Galactic Pinball from Intelligent Systems. Well, actually, maybe it should be called Galactic Puck because you control what appears to be an air hockey puck instead of a pinball. You can select from four different tables to play on. None of them are very inspired or even interesting, honestly. In fact, the same could be said about the entire game itself. It's standard pinball action, but with a puck. You view the board at an angle, which gives it a decent 3D effect. Speaking of 3D effects, this high score screen does a pretty good job. But as far as gameplay goes, it gets boring kind of fast. The physics are okay, certainly not great. Sometimes something will happen which is almost interesting, like becoming some sort of gun thing and you need to shoot down comets as they come on screen. I like the variety, but it's hard to control it when this happens. You probably won't be sinking a ton of time into this one unless you really enjoy pinball at its most basic level. Tetris came to the Virtual Boy courtesy of t and &E Soft. Basically, you're piling blocks in an area which is always moving around so that you can see it at all of the different angles. Your goal is to fill an entire level so that it disappears. Over on the right is a 2D representation of each level to help you see what has blocks and what doesn't. Now, I'm not the world's biggest Tetris fan, but I'd rather play regular Tetris any day over this. It does get a bit more challenging in the upper levels with segmented blocks and it's tough to fill the floor. Tetris just isn't a game that needed reinventing. However, V Tetris by Bulletproof Software, which came out only in Japan, is much better. What can I say? It's Tetris. At least it's regular Tetris. It doesn't try to be anything that it shouldn't. It offers a few different graphical backdrops and musical selections, which is nice. I can't really say anything more about it, mainly because it's basically just Tetris on the Virtual Boy. But I feel that real Tetris fans will definitely like V Tetris more than 3D Tetris. Well, I think anyone would really.
This is Jack Brothers by Atlas, probably the most sought after game on the Virtual Boy. It's very expensive, especially the North American version. Believe it or not, this game is part of the Megami Tensai series. That's right, this game is actually related to Persona in some weird way. You play as one of three Jack Brothers whom you choose at the beginning. You're visiting Earth for Halloween, but it's almost midnight and if you don't get back soon, you'll be trapped forever. So a little fairy decides to help you out and show you the way back. Jack Brothers plays as an overhead twin stick shooter, though you can't shoot diagonally. You don't really need too much though. Also, it should be noted that your attack is different depending on which character you choose. You also have a bomb that you can use. Your life is actually the counter that's ticking down in the upper left corner, so always be sure to pick up extra time when you see it. Your main goal is usually to collect the keys on a level which will let you jump down to the next. You'll defeat lots of enemies along the way. Once you get to the lowest level in a stage, you fight a boss. These bosses can take quite a few hits, but at least they have a life bar. The game is really fun for what it is, and I love going around everywhere looking for keys and getting power-ups that make me invincible. The scaling is a little chunky when you drop down a level, but at least there's some smooth rotation effects here and there. The music is great too. However, one thing that really bothers me is that each time you jump down to a new level, the fairy slowly comes in, tells you some nonsense that you could have easily figured out on your own, then slowly flies away before you can take control. I found this very annoying as it interrupts the action for no reason and you can't skip it. <sighs> now what do you want? At least there's a password feature though. Like I said, this one is crazy expensive, so you probably don't want to buy it. Maybe rent it for a dollar instead. Virtual League Baseball from Chemco is a rather boring baseball game. It's video baseball at its most basic level. If you've played any other video baseball game before, you've probably played a better game than this. The controls are stiff and even slightly laggy, so it takes some time to get used to when you need to swing the bat. Controlling the outfielders isn't much better as you move all of them at once and everything is super tiny. They also don't automatically try to run towards a fly ball. The visuals are pretty bad and the sound doesn't do the game any favors. I'd suggest that you play, well, pretty much any other baseball game. SD Gundam Dimension War is a strategy game that was only released in Japan. You and the enemy both take turns moving along a grid and attacking when you're within range of each other. The problem is that I have a hard time telling what's the enemy and what's my team. Eventually you can attack, but this game just isn't set up very well at all. I can see why nobody bothered translating this and releasing it in North America. Don't waste your time with this clunky turd. Space Invaders Virtual Collection is another one that was only released in Japan. And that's exactly what you get, Space Invaders. You can play the original Space Invaders or Space Invaders Part 2 in 2D. Part 2, which was known as Space Invaders Deluxe in North America, is basically the same thing with a few minor changes like enemies that split apart when shot. Both of these games can also be played at an angled view with an added depth effect. No matter how you slice it, it's just Space Invaders. If you like that though, then there's no reason you won't enjoy this. Here's Tolero Boxer. 
In this boxing game from the future, you play as a pair of disembodied hands and you need to beat the snot out of another robot. The left D-pad and the L button controls your left hand, and the right D-pad and the R button controls your right hand. The control doesn't feel as smooth as I'd like, but you do get used to it. Each robot has their own weak spots as well as their own tells and attacks. It follows boxing rules for the most part, so the fights can take a while. Between rounds, you can mash buttons to get some of your life back. I'm not very good at games like this, so that's probably why I couldn't really get much into this one. Nothing here makes me want to keep putting time into it to get better either. At least the 3D effect is pretty good. However, if you're a big fan of Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, then this is definitely worth a try. Virtual Fishing was only released in Japan from Pack-In Video. This is a fairly relaxing game if you like fishing games, I suppose. First, you choose where you'd like to fish. Then you might have to read a lot of text if you can read that. You can only cast your line straight ahead, then you start reeling it in hoping to get a snag. If you do, press the R button to go into the exciting fish battle screen. Here, you'll see a side view of the fish with some nice parallax scrolling effects. Be careful because otherwise it may get away and you'll have to start over. But if you do it right, you'll catch the fish and it will die. There might be more to this one, but there's a definite language barrier going on here. Otherwise, it's a fairly decent game. Hang in there, we've still got every single Virtual Boy game I haven't covered yet to go. And dare I say, a few of them might actually be good. <music> vertical Force from Hudson Soft is a vertical shooter, as you may have guessed. It's your standard shooter, but with a twist. That's right, you can now press a button to go down into the screen. You fight the game on two levels, a low one and a high one. Enemies are usually on both levels at any given time, and you can only destroy those on the same level you're currently on. Sometimes the stages will even have obstacles like these ridges that you need to fly under to avoid. This game really does its best to take advantage of the 3D feature. As a shooter, it's pretty basic. You have some power-up shots, but nothing here is very interesting once you get over to 3D gimmick. Each stage has a mini-boss and a stage boss, which does its best to fight you on both planes. The graphics are sparse, and honestly, the music isn't very good. Oh, and Blade Eagle 3D on the Sega Master System already did this same exact concept in 3D seven years before this, and it also wasn't very interesting. At least it had better music, though. At the end of the day, this is a rather forgettable shooter. Panic Bomber is also from Hudson Soft. This is one of those match three puzzle games where you battle an opponent. I usually prefer these to Tetris. And the good news is that this one is pretty fun. Obviously, it's based on the Bomberman universe. It plays like most match three style puzzle games with a few twists. You can lay bombs down, but of course they don't go away when you match them. Eventually, you'll get a bomb that'll explode when you set it down, so try to make sure it blows up all of the other bombs. The visuals are good and the music is even better. I thought this would be hard to play on the Virtual Boy's red and black screen, but amazingly it's easy to discern the different icons in order to match them. Overall, I was actually surprised at how much I enjoyed this one. I didn't want to stop playing.
Nestor's funky bowling from Sapphire is based on the incredibly exciting character from the Nintendo Power magazines. You play as Nestor or his sister in their quest to knock over pins with a heavy rolling ball. The meters that dictate how you throw the ball are extremely easy to understand but hard to master. The game moves at a brisk pace and as a result it feels very energetic. The cool animations of Nestor or his sister reacting to their shots also add to this. As a game it's very arcade-like which of course I approve of. It's not the best bowling game in the world but honestly it's not bad at all. You even get three music selections though the music stops playing when you hit the pins. This one was only released in North America. Virtual Bowling, on the other hand, was only released in Japan, this one from Athena. You'd think that with only 22 officially released games worldwide that the Virtual Boy wouldn't even have one bowling game, much less two of them. This one plays at a much slower pace, but it has cool scaling graphics which of course I think are pretty cool. Which I just said, I just said cool twice, whatever. It's cool. Yeah, they're a little chunky, but that's okay. The ball throwing meter here is a little bit more complex, but it's still mostly intuitive after a few throws. The music is decent, but the voices sound like a low-budget Genesis game. I still had a lot of fun with this one, and I scored way better than I do in real-life bowling. Waterworld is another really rare and expensive one. Like the movie it's based on, it's kind of a mess. You play as Kevin Costner on his little boat. In the water are people that look like they need to be saved, but you can't rescue them like you think you need to do. Instead, the evil smokers come in on their ski doos I mean sea doos and try to capture the people who are desperately treading water for some reason. You need to shoot down all of the sea doos and keep the people in the water, called atollers, alive in order to complete the level. That's it! Each level, another person will be thrown into water for you to keep alive and there will be more sea dews. You move around slowly with either D-pad and fire with the L or the R button. The graphics can get a bit choppy and confusing sometimes. The music by Jonathan Dunn is actually really nice and relaxing, but it doesn't fit the action at all. That's fine by me because the action isn't exactly great. If you want to spend close to $400 for 5 minutes of fun, I can't recommend this one enough. Virtual Lab is a puzzle game which was only released in Japan by J-Wing. As far as I can surmise, you're trying to build one giant intestine with the pieces of organs that are dropping. You can flip them around and if you make a self-contained organ, it disappears. But that can be pretty tough to do. This game screams low budget. The graphics are pretty bad, the music is barely there, and for some reason the girls' boobs will twitch on their own for no reason every few seconds or so. I guess that's the game's main draw. Definitely the worst puzzle game on the console, if not the worst game, period. This one is called In's Mouth no Yakata, or something like that, and it was only released in Japan by IMAX. This one is a first-person game where you need to wander the hallways, gather orbs and keys, and find the exit. But be careful because there are evil monsters who don't want you to accomplish this simple task as it simply doesn't align with their personal agendas. And their agenda is to kill you. You have a limited number of bullets to fight these monsters, so it's best to avoid them if you can. Be careful though because they really want to get you and will even break through walls to do so. 
Fortunately, there is a password feature and unlimited continues. The depth effect is decent, but you move and turn in very core steps like the old Might and Magic game, so it's very hard to tell what you just did. Even just one extra frame of animation, one frame, would have helped a ton. Try this one if you can. Space Squash was released only in Japan by Coconuts Japan Entertainment. Yeah, this is basically 3D Pong. You control a robot and you bounce some sort of globule back and forth. You move with the left D-pad and you can press either left, up, or right with the right D-pad to hit the globule. Depending on how you hit it, the direction will change, slightly. The goal is basically just to get your opponent to miss three times. Generally, this is kind of fun and can even get fairly challenging. You can even grab some power-ups, but that takes more luck than skill. Then you get to the snake boss. It's incredibly tough to aim the globule and he's constantly moving around. Of course, he requires a crap ton of hits before he dies. It takes forever and it gets boring really fast. I eventually died after about 10 minutes or so of trying to hit him and then he goes and resets back to his first form. Yeah, no thanks, that's when I shut the game off and I never plan on playing it again. Finally, we have Virtual Boy Wario Land. Yep, that's what it's called, just in case you didn't know this was a Virtual Boy game. Now this is more like it. It's an actual full-fledged game that could easily exist on other platforms where it would get a ton of love. But as of right now, it's still a Virtual Boy exclusive. Someone has stolen Wario's treasure and now he's on a mission to get it back. At least that's what I surmise while watching the epic cinematic cutscene at the beginning. Wario can jump and shoulder smash like usual. Get hit and you become tiny bald Wario and you can't do a shoulder smash. Throughout the game you can get different hats which will give you different powers, like the bull horns to smash big blocks, or the dragon which shoots fire and so on. You go through the game collecting hearts and coins, looking for a key to unlock the level's exit. Sometimes you can jump into the background when you find these little plates on the ground. There's not much strategy to this, it's just kind of tacked on. That's fine though, it doesn't slow the game down at all and it's still fun to do. Between levels, you have a chance to play through some bonus games if you want. Eventually, you'll make it to a boss. These can be pretty tough until you figure them out. Then they're so simple that you wonder why you ever had any issues. I like that. The graphics are perfect all things considered and the depth effect is decent. Even the music is great for this title. It definitely makes you feel like you're playing a proper Nintendo game. This is the best game on the Virtual Boy, and it's a shame that it didn't show up in 3D on the 3DS when Nintendo had the chance. Even a remake in 2D would be fine, as you really don't need 3D to play this at all. If you own a Virtual Boy, this is definitely a must-have. That was every single Virtual Boy game released worldwide. But I'm not done, no. I want to show you a few prototypes that were in development that never got released. In addition to that, I want to show you a few cool things that the homebrew community has been up to. Because why not? Faceball from Bulletproof Software was going to come to the Virtual Boy. Oh man, did the world ever miss out or what? Faceball is a primitive first-person shooter of sorts. You wander around a maze and shoot your opponents before they shoot you. Generally, they're just minding their own business and not trying to hunt you down, but they will still defend themselves. Clear the level of opponents to advance to the next. Sometimes when you kill an opponent, you can collect a power-up which will let you move faster or whatnot. 
Flashing walls can be destroyed if you shoot them to open up passages to the rest of the level. If you press select, you'll bring up a map of the level which will also show you where the creatures that you need to murder are. Overall, it's playable, but far from exciting. The animation is decent as you freely roam around. This ended up being cancelled simply because the Virtual Boy was a flop. This is Bound High from Japan System Supply. That's right, they supply Japan with systems. Okay, yeah, that was weak. This is a game where you play a bubble and you bounce up and down on a play field. In order to clear a stage, you need to bounce on all of the other bubbles that are roaming around. You're actually a robot, but I prefer calling him a bubble. The depth effect in this one is pretty cool and I like things that scale like this, so right away I was kind of enjoying this. There's really not much to this game, at least at this point in its development. There are some obstacles that you'll have to deal with on the ground and even an occasional gust of wind. I made it to the boss stage and it appears there's no boss yet. I've read in places that this leaked ROM is supposed to be complete, yet there's no boss. I think a boss fight using this method could be fun. There's even a mode that's kind of like mini golf or pool where you need to knock the fuzzballs into a hole. This was actually the predecessor to the mega hit Chalvo 55 on the Game Boy. Bet you didn't know that, unless you did. This game was canceled due to the Virtual Boy itself being a huge pile of fail. There's even some full-fledged homebrew games. Did you know that somebody even ported Snatcher over to the Virtual Boy? I'm amazed how close this is, all things considered. I only played for a few minutes, so I don't know if the entire game is here, but they did a remarkable job and it's quite snappy. Even the music is here, though it's very low and grainy. Then there's Mario Combat. In this one, you have a gun and Bowser is moving back and forth. You can't shoot him, only the things that he tosses at you. Obviously this is very incomplete, but I think it could probably be fun if it were fleshed out a bit more. The homebrew community even created a Game Boy emulator for the Virtual Boy. This is pretty crazy because there's no way the Virtual Boy could ever run these games properly. Some games run better than others. Blaster Master Boy here is almost playable. But did you ever think that Castlevania the Adventure was just too fast? <laughs> of course you did. Well, now you can finally play it at a sane speed. You can adjust the depth of these games so that they appear a bit further back in the window, but that's the extent of the 3D effect. This is super cool that they were able to do this, but honestly, this isn't a great way to play Game Boy games. Or how about Mario Kart Virtual Cup? This gives you a taste of what Mario Kart could have been like on the system. Unfortunately, there's nobody to race against, so it's just a time attack against the clock. I do like how they were able to pull off some rudimentary Mode 7 here. Rainbow Road has never looked so colorful. A better racing game might be VB Racing. Granted, there's not much game here as you're only racing the clock, but at least there's other cars on the road. No Mode 7 here, but there are some really smooth hills, and you know I love smooth hills in my racing games. There are some smoothly scaling sprites as well. Unfortunately, there's no sound at all, and your life will be ruined if you hit a tree. 
Eventually you can get loose if you keep hitting the gas and steering towards the road. The best homebrew has got to be Hyper Fighting. I'm not sure, but I think this one might be based on Street Fighter 2. Kind of hard to say. I've got to be honest, I can't believe this is running on my Virtual Boy. All of the characters are here and selectable. The controls take a while to get used to since the B and the A buttons aren't even mapped to anything. The good news though is that the game allows you to remap them. The right D-pad is used for some of the attacks and it's weird, but kind of interesting at the same time. Once I got used to everything, I was able to do fairly well. I did have a few issues pulling off the special moves consistently, which isn't surprising. Still, the game runs fast and it feels quite responsive without a hint of slowdown. There's some graphic garbage when it switches screens, but aside from that, the game feels professionally done. Hell, it's done better than most legitimate Virtual Boy games. There's a depth slider so you can get some cool 3D depending on the stage. Speaking of stages, most of them are from Street Fighter 2, but not all. I mean, why fight Balrog in Las Vegas when you can fight him at some waterfalls in South America instead? The graphics are amazing for the system, if a little bit stretched to fit the Virtual Boy's aspect ratio. Almost every stage here is one-to-one -one with other versions. There are a few stages that lose parts of the background, but Dalsim's stage has all three rows of the elephants. The 16-bit versions only have two rows. That's right, only the Virtual Boy has the 32-bit power needed for all six elephants. There's tons of parallax scrolling as well, which is enhanced by the 3D effect. The character sprites all seem to have most of their animation as well. Even the music sounds pretty good. Many of the voices have made it in, and they also sound good. I wonder how this would have fared if this were a real release on the system back in 1995. Would people have respected the Virtual Boy more? Would it have sold 10 or 20 more systems? We'll never know, but this port is really cool. Well, that's the Virtual Boy for you. I think it's way worse than Sega's 32X, both as a concept and in the quality of the games that it played. It's kind of interesting that the Sega 32X gets a little bit more hate, don't you think? Anyway, I'm glad I found my Virtual Boy for $14 at a thrift store in the box. That's about what I think the system is worth. Still, there are some games that are worth playing on that, and I'd love to see them ported to the Switch or whatever with some color. So what do you think of the Virtual Boy? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Are you feeling down in the dumps? Have you lost all ambition in your life and semblance of a distinct personality? Yeah. Then you need the Nintendo Virtual Boy! Where the hell did that thing come from?! With the Nintendo Virtual Boy, you don't need to be distracted by all three primary colors. We know you don't have time for that, so you only have to deal with one! Seriously, it appeared right out of thin air! Virtual Boy gives you a taste of virtual reality with games that play in all three dimensions. What kind of devil device is this? Virtual Boy offers hours of fun with a huge library of games with that classic Nintendo feel. Monochrome 3D game systems materializing spontaneously is not a future I'm prepared for. The Virtual Boy won't remain in stock for long, so be sure to hurry. Holy crap, it disappeared into nowhere. I'm beginning to question reality as we know it. Visit your favorite retailer today and ask them for the Nintendo Virtual Boy. Ah, that thing is witchcraft!